morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the November 5th, 2020 State Board of Education meeting. I'm Eric Davis, Chair of the Board, and I call this meeting to order. I'd like to welcome all my board colleagues, advisors, staff, visitors, online listeners, and Twitter followers. Remind our visitors and those listening online that this body meets monthly official meeting, typically scheduled for the first Thursday of the month. Due to COVID-19, the board's work was split over two days to provide time for the needed discussions from each respective committee. Today we will include, we will conclude our work with our three remaining committees, the Special Committee on Digital Learning, Educator Standards and Practice, and Business Operations Committee. I remind our visitors and online listeners that you can follow the meeting online and see all of our material by going to SBE meetings at stateboard.ncpublic.gov. This time I'd like to extend the board's congratulations to Superintendent Elect Truitt, Lieutenant Governor Olette Robinson, and Treasurer Caldwell, and we look forward to you joining us and serving the students of North Carolina in the near future. Board members are reminded that it's our duty to avoid conflicts of interest and inherent conflicts of interest as we handle the work of this board. Any member of the board know of any conflict of interest or inherent conflict with respect to any matters coming before us at this meeting. If so, please state them for the record. And if during the course of the meeting you become aware of an actual or inherent conflict of interest, please bring the matter to the attention of the chair. It will then be your duty to abstain from participating in discussion on the matter and from voting on that. At this time, I'd like to call on my colleague, Mr. Chastain, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Chastain. Thank you, Chairman Davis. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before our next regular scheduled State Board of Education meeting, we will celebrate two meaningful holidays, Veterans Day and Thanksgiving. To our veterans, the board extends its thanks to you for your sacrifice and contributions to our country. We salute our veterans across our nation and state. Your selfless service allows us to enjoy the many liberties as you protect our country. Similarly, while we're on our thanks, our Thanksgiving this year will be different from what we are traditionally accustomed to, and we take the time to be thankful that we are safe and well during this pandemic. Please remember, as you're celebrating with your family, the practice of freedom is as we gather with one of your friends and family. We now come to our special recognition on our agenda when we recognize significant awards, proclamations, resolutions, and those who make a difference in the lives of our public school students we serve each day. Together, we have the privilege of acknowledging our National Blue Ribbon School and International Education Week. This time, I recognize Dr. Angie Mullinex to lead these presentations, and following them, Ms. Jill Cabinets will read the proclamation for International Education Week to capture in our meeting record. Dr. Mullinetz. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chairman Davis, Vice Chair Duncan, Superintendent Johnson, and members of the board. On behalf of Dr. Davis Gall, Deputy Superintendent of Equity and Innovation, and the NCDPI staff who served on the 2015 2020 National Blue Schools Committee, I am honored to recognize our 2019-2020 awarded schools for the prestigious National Blue Ribbon recognition. The schools we will recognize today are among the 367 schools nationwide. Sorry, do you have a little feedback? The schools we will recognize today are among the 367 schools nationwide to receive the honor, which recognizes overall academic performance or progress in closing achievement gaps. The coveted National Blue Ribbon Schools Award affirms the hard work of educators, families, and communities in creating safe and welcoming schools where students master challenging and engaging content.
I'm honored to announce that the three schools receiving this award for the 2019-2020 school year are Cross Creek Early College High School in Cumberland County Schools, Piedmont IB Middle School in Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, and PSRC Early College with the public schools of Robeson County. At this time, we will take a moment to highlight each school and to allow for the principal to say a few words on behalf of his or her, her school community. Our first school is Cross Creek Early College High School. This is located in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and it is led by Ms. Patrick, Patsy Patrick. At this time, I would like to ask Ms. Patsy Patrick, principal of Cross Creek Early College, to share some remarks about her school. And I believe she also has some special guests with her who might want to share some remarks as well. Ms. Patrick. Thank you. It's a, an exciting time, even in the midst of COVID. And the success of Cross Creek can be filtered down to one practice that would emphasize uh, on relationships. At a time that values uh, collaboration, we understand the necessity of a sound working relationship between our students and staff. Now, this is not a seamless process. There are challenges when you work with a diverse group of people from various backgrounds and opinions and their teenagers. With work and dedication, positive relationships are built and maintained in the most difficult situations. High expectations are a visible practice of our students. They have learned to recognize the impact of these characteristics. They engage with teachers, professors, employers, their community, and their peers. They have forged positive relationships. Our tagline here at Cross Creek is college begins here. At this time, I would like to have our superintendent, Dr. Conley, to comment. Thank you, Ms. Patrick. And I also have with me this morning Ms. Betty Musselwhite, Associate Superintendent for School Support, to celebrate uh, Ms. Patrick and the 12th Street Early College High School success, one of our most successful schools in North Carolina. Uh, we continue uh, in our strategic plan uh, to focus on successful students. And the Salt Street Early Highlands is a prime example of the work that we're doing here in Tumlin County to make sure that every child has the opportunity to go to Highlands and to choose that or a career or to the military. Thank you, Ms. Patrick, for having us with you on this morning. Thank you, Ms. Patrick and Dr. Connolly. Ms. Patrick, are there any other guests with you this morning? Not at this time, thank you. All my teachers are teaching. Okay, great, thank you so much. And as a graduate of Fayetteville State, I can say um, just kudos to you and your students. Seeing them walk through the halls was always a pleasure. So thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna move on to our second school this morning. We have Piedmont. IB Middle School with Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. It is located in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it is led by Ms. Jacqueline Barone. At this time, I would like to ask you, Ms. Barone, principal of this school, if you would like to share some remarks. Hey, good morning. Thank you very much for having me here at your meeting this morning. I have to give out a quick story, or not story, but um, in looking at Facebook today, I had a memory pop up and it was exactly five years ago today that I was actually with you all in person at the state board meeting when my school was recognized as a global ready school. So it really um, tickled me. What an honor to be back again five years later um, to receive this distinction as well. Uh, but at Piedmont, we are absolutely so proud of the work that we do each and every day, whether we're in person, which is coming up soon for us, or virtual as we are right now. Um, but I have to say that getting this distinction again, um, this is our second time being named a blue ribbon. Um, it really happens because of the community that we have. This award, this honor, 
would not happen without the amazing staff that I have here at Piedmont. And I have the best. I know every principal is going to say that, but I've got the best. Um, and I love each and every one of them. The families that come together to make this school amazing are unreal. And everybody's had to reinvent how they do things and how they support us in a virtual world, but they're doing it and making it happen. And of course, I would not be here with that in front of you today without my kids. Um, they are amazing people. They're doing great things. They've done great things. They're going to continue to do great things. So again, it's such an honor to be here before you um, as a Blue Ribbon School. And hopefully we will continue to make you proud and do great things. Have a great day. Thank you so much and congratulations again. All right, we're going to move on to our third school this morning. And this is PSRC Early College with the Public, public Schools of Robeson County. This school is led by Dr. Christopher Clark. At this time, I would like to ask Dr. Clark, principal of the Early College, if he would like to share some remarks about his school. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm proud to lead the public schools of Robinson County's Early College. We have also received this distinguished award twice, once in 2012 and then again this past school year, um, of which we're you know extremely excited. And I would echo what the previous principal just mentioned. It's all because of the community that I serve in. Awesome teachers, awesome parents, awesome kids. I have a public schools of Robinson County Board of Education who supports us in everything that we try to do for our children. We have a central office staff who nine times out of 10 always approves whatever it is I ask uh, for my kids. I have a, a system over at RCC that supports us as well. So it's truly a community effort that has you know, wound up causing us to be able to bask in this honor. And we thank you. Mr. Craig um, Lowry is here, our chairman of the board, and I'd like for him to say a word or two. Good morning. Uh, again, my name is Craig Lowry. I'm chairman of the Board of Education. And on behalf of the school board members, uh, I'd just like to congratulate Dr. Clark and his staff uh, on this award. Uh, again, as we all know, it's very prestigious and bringing significant recognition to the public schools of Robinson County on what you're doing at the school. And again, like you said, with the community and everyone involved, and we're just uh, so proud of the achievement that you have received and congratulations again. Thank you. I also have uh, my counselor here and a teacher who has an afternoon class. So she's with, with us today. Had a teacher with us online, but she had to log off for class, but um, we are truly honored and we thank you for taking the time to recognize us. That course. And the superintendent DeFries, I'm sorry. Good morning. I'm proud of the early college and the job that the teachers, parents, principal, and of course, the students. They really work hard. I've had the opportunity to visit the school on several occasions and had the opportunity to attend some of the parent teacher organization meetings. And of course, they have a wonderful program with robotics. And we've won several awards in that area. Thank you. And we have with us our school board vice chair, as well as our assistant superintendent for curriculum. <laughs> Thank you. Great, Dr. Clark, does that does that conclude your guests this morning? Yes, ma yes ma'am. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, at this time, I know our state superintendent, Mark Johnson, is super proud of all of our three schools that have received this recognition. And we're gonna take a moment and hear some remarks from Superintendent Johnson. Thank you, Angie. And uh, thank you to all the work of the teachers, the administrators. So much goes into getting this award and it truly is such uh, an honor uh, to have your school designated as a National Blue Ribbon School. And we are grateful for all the work most especially what you do for students, 
Uh, but we're also so proud to be able to have these schools in our great public school system for North Carolina. Thank you so much, Superintendent Johnson. Um, again, thank you to all of the principals, teachers, students, and school community members who work toward this prestigious honor. As a reminder, the Department of Education will formally recognize these schools in their virtual ceremony on November 12th and 13th, and you're welcome to visit the National Blue Ribbon website for more information. Thank you so much. And now we're going to pivot a little bit and we're going to move over to our second special recognition today, which is the 2020 International Education Week. And I'm joined today with uh, Dr. Christy Day, who is going to take it over from here. Thank you, good morning. On behalf of the NCDPI Global Education Steering Committee, I extend sincere gratitude to the State Board for their commitment to and support of global education across North Carolina. The 2020 International Education Week will be celebrated November 16th through 20th. International Education Week is an opportunity to celebrate the benefits of international education and exchange worldwide. This joint initiative of the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of State is part of the effort to promote programs that prepare Americans for a global environment and attract future leaders from abroad to study, learn, and exchange experiences. International Education Week offers the chance to expand awareness of and interest in global issues and global learning, collaborate with and learn from international student groups, gain a new cultural understanding, and sample a small part of life beyond the shores of America. A variety of activities are in the works at DPI to promote and celebrate International Education Week in North Carolina. In September, members of the Global Education Steering Committee began sharing global education resources on social media. This will continue through in an International Education Week. A day of celebration webinar will be recorded, shared, and posted the week of November 16th. This webinar will highlight global education efforts across North Carolina. DPI and the Area Study Centers at UNC Chapel Hill and Duke University will host an interactive webinar series every evening between November 16th and 20th. Each webinar will focus on content and resources related to a specific world region, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East and North Africa. Sessions will address the complexity of challenges faced in the world, introduce issues from multiple viewpoints, and illustrate solutionary thinking. The NC International Education Week Virtual Student Showcase will provide students an opportunity to share their interest and understanding of global issues, global learning, and cultural awareness through various projects, pre presentations, or work samples. The COVID-19 pandemic has given us an opportunity to rethink and redesign education, and NCDPI wants to acknowledge all the ways our North Carolina students and educators are studying global education in the digital age. I would like to thank Felicia Sanders and other members of the NCDPI Global Education Steering Committee for their work and commitment to International Education Week and global education across North Carolina. Their efforts have made these exciting opportunities possible. I would now like to thank and turn it over to Ms. Kamnitz, who will read the pro proclamation. Thank you, Dr. Day. It is my great pleasure to read this proclamation in support of International Education Week from the North Carolina State Board of Education. Whereas the North Carolina State Board of Education has a vision that every public school student will be empowered to accept, accept academic challenges, prepare to pursue their chosen path after graduating high school, and encouraged to become lifelong learners with the capacity to engage in a globally collaborative society. And whereas the North Carolina State Board of Education first adopted a resolution promoting the importance of global education on April 3rd, 2008. And whereas global education remains a priority focus in the North Carolina State Board of Education strategic plan. And whereas the North Carolina State Board of Education engages in partnerships to ensure students and educators have opportunities to interact with international communication and technology. And whereas global education experiences allow students and educators to prepare for collaboration in a constantly changing international environment. 
And whereas the North Carolina State Board of Education recognizes the, important, the importance of developing the whole child with standards that promote strong student character, personal responsibility, and community world involvement. And whereas global education in North Carolina helps educators receive the preparation and professional development in the interconnectedness of the world. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the North Carolina State Board of Education does hereby proclaim November 16th through 20th, 2020, as International Education Week in North Carolina, and that board members direct the secretary to the State Board of Education to enter a copy of this proclamation into the official minutes of the North Carolina State Board of Education, signed by Eric C. Davis, Chairman, and Mark R. Johnson, Superintendent, November 5th, 2020. Thank you, Ms. Candace and Dr. Mullinex for that presentation and even more, the board extends its congratulations to all of our students, teachers, principals, and parents in our National Blue Ribbon Schools, as well as celebrates the tireless efforts of DPI staff and educators across our state to provide an international education to the benefit of our students. During the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the most important partnerships that has grown and strengthened has been ours with the Department of Health and Human Services. We have to extend our appreciation to Secretary Cohen, every member of her staff, for their tireless efforts in keeping our students, teachers, and all staff safe during this pandemic while working with us to strive to reopen all of our schools to in-person instruction. We've incorporated regular COVID-19 updates to influence our decisions on school operations, and these updates remain important to the board and agency as our K-5 students are beginning to return for in-person instruction. Today, we'll hear from our great partner, Chief Deputy Secretary Susan Gale Perry, and her colleague, Dr. Becky Tilson, for the latest update from the Department of Health and Human Services. I'll now recognize Chief Deputy Gail Perry. Good morning, Chairman Davis, and good morning, everyone. It is always a pleasure to be with you. I'm so grateful for the partnership with you, Chairman Davis, but also with all the, the members of the State Board, um, the, the many superintendents that we've had the privilege of engaging with, and, and our teachers and our principals for all of the incredibly great work going on around the state and, and certainly our ongoing wonderful partnership with our friends at DPI, including uh, Dr. Stigall and Dr. Emery. So uh, right back at you. Thanks for the, the great partnership. And we're really glad to be with you this morning. I, I know that many of you are, are noticing that we are seeing some slowly rising cases in North Carolina. And although We've been fortunate in, in not seeing the kind of spikes that we've seen elsewhere in the country. We know that you have some questions and concerns about that. Um, obviously, we're moving into a time where there's more challenges with greater amounts of time being spent indoors. It's colder weather. Um, we know that folks are worried about flu, and we're going to talk a little bit about flu and vaccines. And we know that folks are interested in, in, in even more data and information that they can use to make the local decisions that they're making about uh, school opening. And I think, as always, we all share the, the goal of having our children in school where we know they get the best learning. And so we're going to do everything that we can in our presentation today to uh, to, to answer some of those questions and, and give you more information that you might find useful to you. I do want to start by saying that we could really use your help on a couple of things. And uh, the two things I'm going to ask for your help on today is to continue doing the kind of role modeling that is just so critical in your local communities by practicing the three W's, especially showing your um, that you're wearing your face coverings and, and talking about how important that is. We've just heard such good reports from schools on 
on compliance among students and are grateful for that. So we encourage you to keep role modeling and talking about it in your local communities. Also, as we're moving into a time of holidays for many of us, um, I do want to highlight that we've got some social gathering guidance out. We're about to put out some specific guidance around um, Thanksgiving. I ask that you please help share that um, among your staff and families. We're going to have a very simple one pager coming out either at the end of this week or early next week. We encourage you to share that. We want folks to have the safest possible. Uh, celebrations with friends and families during this holiday season. So stay tuned for that. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn the bulk of our presentation time over to Dr. Betsy Tilson. Um, she is our state health director. She's been a tremendously wonderful partner in our school work, and she's going to talk you through some of the data and issues that we're seeing. And also with me today is our wonderful early childhood, our senior early childhood and um, and, and K-12 advisor, uh, Becky Planchard. So we're all here uh, to answer questions, but Dr. Tilson, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, wonderful. Uh, great, yeah, so we're just gonna talk through some of our state level data, just so that you have a little bit of a context, a little bit what we're seeing with our trends. We'll drill down into some of the data specifically around children and then specifically around schools. Um, and then we also then will pivot to some of the resources that you all and school districts can use to, as they start thinking through their operational logistics. Um, we want to talk about the layers of prevention, which are exceedingly important. Um, that's the way we we'll mitigate um, some of our metrics. And at the very end, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, vaccines. Um, not just flu, but our, our regular childhood and school required vaccines, and then just a tiny little bit of a teaser of an upcoming on the horizon, our COVID vaccine, um, and then we'll have time for questions. So, um, okay, on this first slide, just want to make sure you all know where we are as a state, and I really hope that you all know um, and visit our public dashboard as often as, as you want. Um, we're trying to be as, as transparent um, and public with all of our data so everybody can follow along with us. As I hope you're aware, there are four key metrics that we follow. One is what we call our our early indicator, and this looks at the number of people or the percentage of people who are coming to emergency departments with symptoms that are consistent with COVID, and we call this an early indicator. That the, the bottom gray lines are past years. Um, those are really more people um, coming with flu symptoms, which you may be aware, somewhat similar to COVID. The red line is the COVID, um, and you can see we had that peak in the summer. Um, and then we had a little bit of a peak a couple weeks ago, but that is declining. So that is potentially a little bit of good news that people aren't coming to the emergency department for COVID-like illness. On the right-hand side, though, you will see the number of um, lab-confirmed cases. We know there's more cases out there that aren't lab-confirmed, but what one of our tracking is our lab-confirmed. And here you'll see that the peak, you'll see our peak in July. Then we came down. Uh, had a little bit of peak around when colleges opened, but on the right-hand side now, you'll see this increasing of our um, daily case counts. So we are going up. We aren't in a really vertical acceleration like other parts of the country, but we are definitely going up. On the bottom left, you'll see our percent positive out of the total number of tests that are done, how, what percent is positive. In the summer, this was higher up around 10%, which is, which is quite high. Our goal is it for it to be below 5%. Um, and we, we were there um, earlier um, in September all, and now we're a little bit above about 6%. So not as high in the summer, which is great, um, but not quite as low as we would want to be. And this is a way to somewhat um, balance out uh, how much of the cases are we are we just finding because we're increasing testing versus how much more viral spread that is? And the lower the percent positive, um, that means more of those cases are really coming from increased testing. So we're not quite there yet and, and probably still need to do some more increased testing. And then on the bottom right is our hospitalizations. Um, this is what we call a lagging indicator. It takes a while for someone to get exposed and then sick and then sick enough to actually need hospitalizations. And so this balances out our early indication of, of hitting the emergency department. And our hospitalizations are up 
slightly um, from before, but um, not accelerating greatly, which is which is good. Um, but one of our biggest concerns, I think we've articulated a lot, is we need to try to keep our cases down such that we don't overwhelm our healthcare system. Um, so we keep a really close eye on this. So that's where we are, kind of a, as we say in somewhat non-technical terms, uh, we're not hair on fire. But we are um, we are we are pretty vulnerable, and we need to be exceedingly vigilant, um, especially as we're seeing those cases go up. Okay, next slide. A little bit more about some of the nuance in the data and and what we're seeing in terms of the trends. The course of this pandemic has really changed um, as we've gone through some of the phases. And what we are seeing now is when we're looking at our cases that they are increasing more quickly in the rural areas than in the urban areas, which was slightly different um, pattern that we had seen before. So we are seeing across all of our age groups um, a fair amount of the increase of these cases coming from our rural. Um, communities. So for those of you who are out in our rural communities, and, and as uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Gail Perry was saying, your leadership um, and really modeling those preventive behaviors, especially in our rural areas, is going to be really, really important. The other areas that we're seeing in some of our cluster data is um, we're definitely seeing spread in small social gatherings. So these are gatherings below the mass gathering limits, but small social gatherings, backyard barbecues, small weddings. Um, we're seeing a fair amount of spread in that. And as we go forward and thinking through the holiday season, um, that is one of the reasons we're trying to be so proactive about the smaller social gatherings and Thanksgiving is because that is, that is definitely an area we're seeing spread. People feel comfortable. It's a smaller amount. You know the people. There are people in your family. Um, and maybe lowering some of the prevention practices so um, um, being able to push out um, and encourage those preventive measures in the small social gatherings will be really important. The other area we're seeing some spread and a fair amount of clusters are in our houses of worship as well. Um, and so we have a great faith um, leader toolkit um, and would really help with a, kind of a force multiplier and really engaging with our faith communities to be sure that people can worship um, in a way that is safe. So those are some of our state level trends. Um, and again, we have guidance and tools um, that we would love for you to be our force multiplier as we're trying to reach out to those, those stakeholders. Okay, next slide, please. Wonderful. Now coming in a little bit more um, to what we're seeing with kids and schools. Hopefully you're aware, and I have the link on the bottom slide, as we do try to update at least monthly um, some of the, the recent studies and what we are learning um, um, because we're, we're we're learning every day, all the time. And one, we had, a, I think, a, a conversation with you all a couple months ago, and what I said was the one thing we know for sure is that we don't know everything and that we can continue to get new data and we'll continue to update our guidance. Um, and so what we are learning um, in a little bit of a nutshell is, one, that we know we don't know everything. That's important. Second is that we do know that children can get and they can spread COVID-19. We do know that. Um, but... One of the things we are consistently finding um, is that children in general um, have, have mild illness or, or no symptoms, not to say completely, and we definitely know there's some children that can have severe illness, but in general, they have milder illness or maybe no symptoms. And so that leads us to this third, this third bullet that we get, yes, children definitely can spread the virus, but what we're finding somewhat consistently is that children, especially younger children, maybe 10 and under, um, may be less likely to get the infection and then may be less likely to spread um, the infection than adults. And then the older the child gets and the more they are kind of biologically like adults, so the older adolescents, then they start acting more like adults and they can spread more um, similar to adults. And the other thing that we are continuing to find um, and we are, we are asking a lot of other states, looking at our data within North Carolina, looking across the country and internationally is that although yes, there are cases and there are clusters in school settings, I think we all expected that, we still are not seeing our school settings as a big driver of the cases. So when we think about what's causing the surge of our cases in North Carolina and we continue to look every day, it does not seem that it is the schools themselves that are a big driver of that. And I just have a, a couple very recent articles that came out within the past month um, that um, are somewhat are, are consistent with that as well. And we'll, we have them and we will be incorporating them in our up-to-date data. Okay, next slide, please. 
So a little bit more of our North Carolina data. This looks at our um, cases across all ages. The top one, especially with that big peak, um, in the end of August, beginning of September, those are our college age students. Um, and so, um, and they, that's that group, our young adults or college age students where we're seeing a, a lot of cases in that big surge. The, the darker blue line, that very bottom line, is our kids zero to 17. Um, and then the adults of varying um, ages are in the, in the middle. So you'll see that uh, still the zero to 17, the kids um, still have relatively low rates of infection and, and are not driving our increases. Next slide, please. Wonderful. Um, and then this is somewhat of a, a similar slide, but this just looks specifically at um, people, breaks it down a little bit more granular, people 24 and under, so our college students and then our K-12 um, and adolescents. And so what you'll see is still that, the, that teal, those are our college students. Amongst our students, those are the ones that are really um, um, driving that. Um, and then you'll see the red and gold are our middle school um, and adolescents. And then purple is the um, five to nine. And then the blue and gold are our little ones in our pre-K. So um, you'll see that the little ones in pre-K and up to the purple are really not driving um, those cases in our in our children. Next slide. And one thing I did want to highlight, and this is a little bit of a good news, is that in the very beginning of the pandemic, we were seeing a lot of disproportionate cases amongst our African American communities. That thankfully has leveled off, and then now we're seeing at least we don't want anybody to get infected, but at least proportional infection in our African American community. We also were seeing um, in the um, later spring a huge, huge increase in our Latinx population. That's the green line up top. Thankfully, although still we're seeing disproportionate rates in our Latinx community, that has come down. Um, not enough, it's still not proportional, but that at least is coming down. And so um, thankfully we're seeing a little bit of a, of, again, a narrowing of that, of that, um, that disproportion amongst our, our historically marginalized population. And as I alluded to, where the surge we're seeing now is in our rural white population. Um, and then also want to highlight that on our public dashboard, we are breaking our data down by age, race, gender, ethnicity, so you can follow along as well. And then driving into a little bit more about our clusters at K-12. Now, we just want to be sure to, we're clear that not all of our cases associated with school are associated with a cluster, um, but it is hard, often hard to really track back exactly what's a school-associated case or not. Um, but we are able to track our clusters because those are required to be reporting. So just want to be sure we're um, clear about the limitation of our cluster data. But as we look at our K-12 reported clusters, total clusters, those who are currently active or complete, um, that uh, we have a total of 390 cases um, that are associated with um, a K-12 cluster, and thankfully no deaths so far linked to K-12 clusters. And then of our current clusters, um, we have a um, little less than 300 cases that are associated with um, current clusters. Um, and on the next slide then, um, just to put a little bit of longitudinal um, view on this, these are all of our educational associated clusters. The yellow or gold, those are our college and universities. So of our educational clusters, it is those college and universities that are driving it. Same thing, it was very consistent with our age um, data. The purple are our K-12 um, clusters. Um, and so you can see they remained um, pretty low as we have gone forward. The other thing just to put in perspective, so um, total statewide, our total cases are 282,000 plus. Of that, um, going back to that we had, you know, about 300 cases or so associated with a K-12 cluster, that means about 0.1% of total cases are from K-12 clusters. Again, showing us that part of our surge is not, we can't put, um, pinpoint that on these clusters coming from K-12, which is good. Next slide, please. Wonderful. Um, and so based on all of that data and the evolving data, and we'll continue to adjust our guidance as we go forward, but um, that, again, that data, that thinking, um, understanding that we don't think the educational setting will be a driver. Also that idea that children, especially younger children, seem to be less likely to transmit, that then um, had informed our, our policy decision to allow all schools to go into Plan B, um, layering on those pre preventive factors, but also to allow Plan A or Plan A for the K-5 elementary school because of that, the, the signal we were seeing about those younger kids being less likely to, um, um, to transmit. 
Um, and then again, we are very, very, very in support that um, in school learning is the best for children, but we need to be um, flexible um, and then also be flexible with our families. Um, who may be choosing uh, remote learning based on the risk factors of those families. Okay, wonderful. And then just a couple more slides and I'm coming to the end, I promise. But thinking through what are other resources that are available for you all. Next slide, please. Wonderful. Uh, many of you may have been aware of this, but we just wanted to call out that um, maybe about a month ago, the CDC did release some um, indicators for dynamic school decision making is what they what they called. And so a little bit of a of a guide or things to think about um, as our local districts are making the decisions of what's right for their community. One of the things that I think is most important, and I took this as a direct quote from the CDC guidance, is that um, that again. I, we don't think that the schools themselves will be a nidus of, of outbreak, but what, the, what will happen in the schools will be dependent upon what is going on in the communities around them. It'll be transmission in the community that will be coming into the school, not so much what's going on in the school that will be then affecting the community transmission. And so the CDC said this, in short, success in preventing the introduction and subsequent transmission of SARS-CoV-2, that is the virus that calls cause of COVID in schools is connected to and dependent upon preventing transmission in communities. This is really, really, really important because the best way we will have success in our schools is to lower that viral community transmission. So everything we were talking about on the, on the top part of this, exceedingly important. You as school leaders, the best thing we can do is help to decrease that viral transmission in the communities. The indicators that the CDC offers up looks at um, uh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Looks at the um, a couple of quantitative metrics. Looks at the number of cases um, per hundred thousand over the past fourteen days. Looks at the percent positives. Um, in the areas, and then also, and this is exceedingly important, looks at how many of the mitigation strategies that can be put into place to reduce the risk in a school setting. Um, and those, all those mitigation strategies are all very much covered in our North Carolina um, Strong School um, Guidance. And then you can see the way that the CDC has kind of tiered the risk of transmission um, based on those two quantitative metrics. What, um, go ahead, next slide. What we've tried to do to help um, communities be able to use the CDC guidance and really put it into action is on our public facing dashboard. We wanted to be sure that there was guidance uh, metrics aligned with those CDC metrics. And so what you'll see on our public facing dashboard is at the county level, you can click on any county. You can look at your cases per 100,000. I showed you that toggle um, switch and then also go at the last 14 days and then you can see exactly how the counties are lining up based on those CDC metrics. And on the next slide, on the next slide, please, there we go. You can also see specifically what's the percent positive um, in each county as well. So um, people can use that to track where they are with the quantitative metrics. And then again, thinking through all the mitigation strategies of those qualitative metrics is exceedingly important. Next slide, please. Great, right. and then a little bit more, I think those preventive, those mitigation strategies are exceedingly important. I do not think we can undersell the importance of the mitigation strategies um, and the three W's as simple as they sound, they are actually exceedingly um, um, helpful and effective and in preventing the spread. Next slide. I wanna highlight a recent study um, that I think um, uh, speaks to this. Uh, I think we've all known that there's a fair amount of uh, of percent of a population that um, have has the infection but don't have symptoms. We knew this was sizable. There was a recent study that just came out a couple of weeks ago that actually looked up that that found even up to 75% of people with the infection may not have symptoms. Exceedingly important and something that we don't see with other um, with other viruses. Um, and so next slide. This is one of the data points that makes it exceedingly important to be wearing those face coverings at all time because you can have the infection but not know it. Um, and so this is yet another data point um, that we're leaning to um, and that strong, strong messages of wearing um, that face covering at all time. And hopefully you have seen um, our, our um, public messaging, hopefully you're using it and spreading it, um, but getting high in the mask, the reason the masks are so important is again, up to potentially 75% of people may not know they have 
the infection exceedingly important. Hope that you're using these resources. The other piece is thinking about the science of, of the three W's and we like to, well, at, Becky and I like to talk about our prevention strategies, this layered strategies is like a prevention lasagna. That is all about the layers. As many of the layering on of prevention strategies, the better. And there was a really nice article that came out a couple of weeks ago from Thailand. They looked at people who had the infection COVID and what was the risk of, a, of, an, of another person getting infected from that person. Greatly reduced the risk of getting infected if, if you're even if exposed, um, about 85% with that social distancing, 77% by always wearing a mask, 76% by decreasing the duration of contact to under 15 minutes, and 67% by frequent hand washing. Really, really preventive or um, protective factors, and you layer them on, and you can really reduce the risk quite dramatically. And Dr. Tilson, this is Susan. Dr. Tilson, can you just um, clarify the 15 minutes? Because I think there's been some confusion on that. I think you could help clarify that. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And so, um, and there was some new CDC guidance um, that had came came out recently that helped to put some time frame on that. We had always were working on it. Doesn't have to be. Um, at the same time, it could be cumulative. It wasn't just 15 minutes at one time, but it could be, um, you know, five minutes here, five minutes there. What the CDC helped us give a, an end of that time frame that is within 24 hours. So if you have contact less within six feet for more than 15 minutes within 24 hours, that is considered a close contact. So it is cumulative over 24 hours. Wonderful. The, um, the other piece, the nice thing about these three W's um, is that uh, coronavirus is a respiratory virus, like many, many, many other respiratory viruses, and this is respiratory virus season. So the lovely thing about the three W's is that they also protect against flu and other respiratory viruses as well. So it's kind of a win-win. Uh, these preventive strategies are, are great uh, for COVID and beyond. Next slide. Um, and then a couple other tools that are available for you all. Next slide, please. Um, we um, continue to look at and update our our um, our strong schools um, up, um, toolkit. Um, and so we'll be doing updates. I think we're trying to time as much as possible with these updates. Um, and so we've done some clarifications. There was a little bit of confusion about could you get a doctor's note to come back without a COVID test? And so we have um, clarified some of that language to make it a little bit clearer that if somebody has a symptom of COVID that they're able to see a provider um, and that provider can uh, basically attest that there is another diagnosis or a reason why they don't think that that um, person would need a COVID test, then um, they can, um, they don't have to be excluded from school. Um, we tried to make the symptom screening questionnaire a little bit easier to use. Um, and then um, e making it easier of exactly when somebody could come back um, versus not. So those are just things that we had heard was a little bit confusing. So we tried to tighten up that language as much as possible. Um, and so that update should be coming out hopefully later today or tomorrow. Another really, really important tool that we hope everybody is taking advantage of is our Slow COVID North Carolina app. This is a digital app, completely anonymous digital app that you can download. And what it can, what it will sense is that if somebody tests positive and they can um, put that in the app that they tested positive, then there can be a notification to any other phone that was within six feet for more than 15 minutes to a phone where somebody said that they were positive. Um, so it's been a way that people can do this um, anonymous contact tracing. We have more than 300,000 downloads um, already. I think it'll be a great another yet layer um, in our toolkit. So I'd really, really um, encourage everybody to download the free um, Slow COVID um, app. And then finally, though, I think these are just last, um, maybe the very last slide is the other piece when we think about prevention, um, vaccines is such a critical, critical part of our, um, of our toolkit in prevention. Really, really want to stress we're heading into flu season. This is a, 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 a disease for whom, for which we do have a vaccine. We really, really, really want to decrease as much respiratory virus as possible. So flu vaccine more important than ever this year. Really want to encourage that. I know a lot of schools have been doing a lot of work around flu vaccine clinics at schools, which I think is awesome. Um, one thing I did want to bring awareness to, I think probably you all are aware, but we do have lower rates of vaccination completion 
for our regular required child and adolescent vaccines um, than in the past because of some of the barriers about the pandemic. We did extend the deadline for documentation of the required um, school vaccines until December 30th, um, but we are going to have to push really, really, really hard to make sure that we are getting those required regular vaccines up to date before December um, 30th. So whatever we can do um, as part of a concerted effort to get those required um, vaccines, exceedingly important. And then just a little bit of a, of a um, teaser and happy to come back in the future is that on the horizon, uh, we are hoping to be having a, a COVID-19 um, vaccine, um, probably for the majority of kids and, and our staff and North Carolina, North Carolinians, not until the spring, um, but hopefully we will be able to get some bit of it for our high risk people um, earlier than that. And that's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Tilson. Um, and Chairman Davis, we'll turn it back over to you, but we would love to answer any questions and offer um, coming back and doing our COVID vaccine 101 um, presentation with Dr. Tilson, if that would be helpful um, to folks in, in, in a future meeting. Thank you so much. I'll call on my colleagues for any questions for Chief Deputy Gail Perry or Dr. Tilson. This morning. Thank you for the presentation this morning. Looking back at the slide that has the um, number of cases over time, and I see the uh, variety in spikes. Did the recovery rate change um, during any of those spikes, and did it remain constant? And why is there a reluctance to um, to at least put the information out to the public about the state's recovery rate from from cases of COVID? Yeah, um, so the recovery rate is just a really hard, uh, we don't have a really good reliable data um, for that. Um, actually, there's a lot of things that go into recovery. So one, we don't have a reliable, again, data point to go back and ask people when they have recovered. Um, we have a reliable data point of when they were diagnosed with that lab report, but we don't have a reliable data set of going back and asking people uh, when they have recovered. Um, what we're doing is a, a little bit of a mathematical modeling, and that is how the CDC is doing it. There's not a great national standard, and basically we are thinking through, in general, when do people get released from isolation? In general, when do people resolve their symptoms? Um, if you don't need to be hospitalized, and then we also model for people who are hospitalized. It often takes them longer to recover, and then we have to then also pull in the, the number of, uh, fortunately, of people who have died. So our recovery rate is a little bit more of a mathematical modeling piece. Um, and the other piece that we are learning, actually more and more, and this is data we can bring back, is this percentage of long haulers. It's not an all or a nothing. It's not that you, you get it and you either die or survive. We are finding a lot of people with um, ongoing um, symptoms. Um, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, maybe even longer, and even including our young, healthy people, one in five still have symptoms beyond 90 days. So we're finding this is a lot more of a, of a chronic um, disease as well, and so that's a hard thing to quantitate in terms of the recovery rate. So the recovery rate, again, right now, the best we can do is kind of a mathematical model of, on average, when do people um, get better? So that's the reason, um, that, and we do post it, but it's just not a great um, data point that we have a lot of confidence in the, in the accuracy of it. Chair Davis. Yes, Chair Davis, this is Ms. Kamnitz. Ms. Kamnitz. Yes, um, just a quick question about this excellent presentation and all the links and the updated toolkit that's coming. How is this being disseminated to our PSAs across the state so that they, I know many people listen to these meetings and probably from the presentation, but how do we get it into their hands and be sure it's there? Uh, Becky Planchard, I, you want to talk about all of the ways that we distribute and share this information? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. This is Becky Planchard, Senior Policy Advisor. Um, first of all, thank you all. I think the question is a great one. Um, this is really great information, and there are a lot of schools and a lot of parents and a lot of um, school leaders across the state who are interested in it. Um, I think we can always 
do better. I'll say that first. Um, but we really are grateful for partnership with um, the leadership team at DPI, um, in particular, uh, Dr. Stigall and Emery um, and Jessica Swanky, who has They've all been supporting dissemination efforts to superintendents regularly, to our charter schools regularly. Um, and so we disseminate information through them anytime, um, and our public information officers at our school district, anytime updates come out. Um, we try to send out links to the state board um, meeting uh, slide decks after they are done. Um, but we widely disseminate any updates to the guidance and provide follow-up webinars about every other week or so to answer questions as they come up. Thank you for that clarity. Last year, Duncan, uh, some of our uh, superintendents are reporting that there are many fabulous local DHHS or local health departments that are providing good advice and are extremely supportive and helpful. But there has been some indications there is some inconsistency on that where, for example, they're trying to get a, a go-ahead or a clearance to open a school is, is uh, not stated as clearly or supported as clearly from the local department. Is there a way DHHS can assist in that process to help give guidance to the superintendents who are looking to make the right decisions uh, based on the whatever may exist in their particular county? This is Susan Gail Perry. I can take. I, I had a hard time hearing that question exactly. I, I think I heard the question to be um, how, how what additional guidance can DHHS give to superintendents in making local decision making? Is 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 that is was that the question? Yes, that was the gist of the question. If you can hear me. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, thank you. Sure. I'm happy to take that. So a, a few things I think you saw in Dr. Wilson's presentation. We are now sharing and have updated our dashboard to allow folks to um, compare their case rates and, and their metrics relative to the CDC guidance. I think, though, and, and, and what I've repeatedly said, and Dr. Tilson, feel free to, to weigh in here. Is so, so important is that just looking at the metrics alone is really insufficient because what we know and what you saw from from the research Dr. Tilson showed is that those mitigation strategies are really a key, a key variable and, you know, the effectiveness of preventing spread. So I, I think what what school district leaders need to be thinking about is is not only their their metrics relative to COVID, but also their capacity to implement the mitigation strategies all the time, every day, um, consistently, and and that should be a, a driving factor in their decision making. We do a lot of work with with superintendents and local health to get directors together on the phone, talking through issues, talking through ways of of making those mitigation strategies and, and communication links even stronger. Um, and, and as you know, as a state, unlike many states, North Carolina has taken the step of certain of, of laying out statewide minimum required metrics. And, and we do that by looking carefully at the combination of of our state data and the metrics that we look at in combination with each other, but also in relationship to those mitigation strategies that we are continually updating in the Strong NC's uh, toolkit. So, you know, we've been pretty clear and careful and measured in the steps that we've taken moving forward. And what we've, we've told all districts right now today is that, um, opening in plan B for your middle and high school students and, and considering opening at plan A um, are, are steps that, that districts can consider. And Dr. Tilson, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, no, I think that that is a, um, a great thing. The only thing I would say is right. And then we, we are working 
Uh, we have weekly, at least weekly calls with our health departments um, and lots of um, communication in between um, as well and do lots of webinars with our health departments and joint with our local communities as well. And so bringing our local health departments in the fold as we work through this is something that is um, exceedingly high on our radar and, and our activity. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Chairman Davis. Chairman Davis, this is Todd Chastain. Mr. Chastain. I wanted to ask Dr. Tilson interesting question. Two of the charts were very interesting to me. The, uh, the chart dealing with college-age students, uh, there's a big yellow, big, tall, long bars on the yellow. Then another chart uh, was green. Uh, have we done studies on the on the particular college towns like Boone and Wilmington uh, have, have you seen uh, you know, definitive data showing that that kind of not only calls the spread within the college but maybe the community Yeah, one of the things that we we're looking at and also looking at some of our national national data um, as well is, and, and as we look forward to Thanksgiving, we're thinking this about as well is, you know, so we have the kids um, at, at school um, and then if there's a de-densifying and then they go home, then is there a, a spread to um, out in the community? Um, and so we're seeing some of that trends. We think there may have been some of that um, that spread to the community, um, not completely. And there's some things that we had done already, like especially the colleges that we're going to de-densify. We had the students test before they went home. We had them quarantined for 14 days um, as if they were going home. So there may have been some of that spread from the college universities out to the community. It's one of the things as we look forward to Thanksgiving, um, making, and we're working with our Institute of Higher Education and really encouraging um, the kids to quarantine two weeks before they leave campus, making sure they're tested before they leave campus as a way to minimize some of that community spread out of the Institutes of Higher Education. So I think, yes, we probably saw some of that out in the community. Um, hard to completely quantify all of it, but um, I think we did see some of that. And again, nationally, I think we saw some of that. There was a really interesting study that came out of Wisconsin that saw some of that, and we're trying to not replicate that as we head into the Thanksgiving um, season. But, you know, our obviously our, our communities, our Institute of Higher Education, are connected to communities, and there's no wall between our universities and our communities, and this virus can easily spread. So I, um, we, we, I think we are seeing some of that and trying to prevent seeing that in, in Thanksgiving as well. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? Hearing none, I'd like to extend the board's thanks to Chief Deputy Gail Perry and Dr. Filson for this report and for ongoing efforts in the Department of Health and Human Services and protecting our communities and our schools. And we leave this presentation mindful that one of the surest ways to get our students back in school is to maintain the health and safety of our communities that our schools are in, okay. and to do so by our personal commitment to following the three W's as outlined in this presentation. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Now I'll turn to Superintendent Johnson for the attendance report. Superintendent Johnson. Thank you. Obviously a big week with a lot of news, uh, but some very exciting news for a lot of families in North Carolina, including my own, uh, is that many students got to return to in-person learning in classrooms this week. Uh, my hat is off to all the educators across the state who have already been in classrooms. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. I had the privilege to drop my daughter off at school on Monday. And I, I can tell you her joy and the excitement of all the students getting dropped off that day cannot truly be expressed in words, especially for our young elementary school students. But it's just it's so great to see them back in school. Uh, it looks different than it did last year, masks and social distancing, but it is just so wonderful. And we are so appreciative to all the school leaders across the state and all the educators for making that possible. Uh, also, uh, Really good update. I had uh, very long conversations and very productive conversations with Superintendent-elect Truett yesterday. Uh, she is going to.
take some time uh, to uh, take some time off the end of this week, but next week we're going to get together and talk in person. And I look forward to having uh, an extremely productive transition uh, where I will be able to hand off the priorities and work of the department to her. And we're very excited about starting that process. And again, I really look forward to bringing her in so she can meet all the division directors, understand what all the divisions are working on and the priorities. And of course, I will immediately next week get her involved in our leadership calls on the COVID-19 response. So looking forward to that transition uh, and uh, it is going smoothly already. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Johnson. We'll now proceed to our remaining committee reports and I remind committee chairs and the audience that all voting on consent any item requiring action will occur at the end of the agenda via roll call. We'll now proceed to the special committee on digital learning and I call on the vice chair of that committee, Ms. Jill Camden. Camden. Thank you, Chair Davis. Um, in, in the Lieutenant Governor's absence, I'm happy to, um, I'm, I'm not sure, we have a very long list of presenters here and I'm not sure who's gonna start us off, but um, we will, sorry. Um, for we are, we're going to hear about um, the digital learning initiative update. Thank you, Ms. Kamnitz. Good morning, Chairman Davis, Vice Chair Duncan, Superintendent Johnson, and board members. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the Digital Learning Initiative quarterly update. I am Dr. Vanessa Wren, Director of Digital Teaching and Learning, and I am joined with several folks today that I'm going to introduce as they, and, and give you a brief overview of what they're going to talk about. Um, with me today is Lindsay Seip, and she is the Southwest Digital Teaching and Learning Regional Consultant. And Lindsay has been working very closely with Julie Gerganis, another one of our regional consultants, as they support the process and the work of the Digital Learning Initiative grants. But what we're going to do today is provide a brief overview of this last year's work and then turn it over to some of our special guests who I'm going to introduce as they share some of the work that they have been doing. We all witnessed almost firsthand the infrastructure and educator preparedness gaps across the state as we moved to blended and remote instruction. Even though the challenges were tremendous, we were hearing from our DLI grant awardees that they felt a bit more prepared. So after I give a brief overview of the 2019-2020 work, we're gonna hear from two of those districts and they are gonna share their firsthand experiences. So with us today from Mooresville Graded District is Dr. Scott Smith, Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Instruction and Technology, and Ms. Tracy Wade, who is the Secondary Curriculum Coordinator. And then next, we're gonna hear from Superintendent Dr. Lisa McLean from Granville County Public Schools, Assistant Superintendent Dr. Michael Myrick, and their Technology Director, Gwen Lofton. And again, they're going to share the impact that the Digital Learning Initiative grants had on their county and how they use those grants to impact educators and particularly students as they transition to remote and blended learning. So on this slide, you see several of our work streams from the 2019-2020 year. Now we had to make a, a huge adjustment midstream um, as we all went to some virtual support, but I wanted to highlight several of the workflows. Again, the Digital Learning Initiative is made up of recurring and non-recurring funding, and it's specifically designed to support digital age learning, personalized learning, micro-credentials, and innovative education practices. And the DLI initiative is guided by the North Carolina Digital Learning Plan and the Future Ready Framework. 
And remember, State Board, we um, have our districts complete the digital learning plan rubric every two years. It's aligned with the teaching working conditions survey. And that plan is actually that rubric is actually due December 30th of this year. And it guides our work and it guides how we support all the schools across the state. But really briefly here, I want to go over some of the work streams from this past year. And the first one is um, the professional learning with the Friday Institute and some of our internal programs. We currently have a cohort where we've partnered with the Friday Institute to provide coaching for remote instruction and blended instruction. And we have 150 participants in that cohort now. We've also transitioned much of our own site professional learning to virtual professional learning, and we have started the NC Bold virtual conference series. We had our last conference in September. We had 57,000 individual educators who participated in that professional learning and another series set to begin in December. We've also worked closely with our educator preparation programs as part of this work stream. We have continued our work with the North Carolina independent colleges and universities and the UNC system. Back in January, when we brought you our last quarterly update, we actually heard from Dr. Hope Williams and Tom West, and we learned about the work that they were doing with the UNC systems and with the independent colleges and universities. And we also focused in on the micro credentials. So that work is continuing. And our plan for this next year of this work is to focus on our administrator preparation programs as well. We've also completed a digital learning standards course for educators, which is an on demand course that we will be rolling out actually tomorrow and um, to have available for educators as they learn the student standards for um, digital learning. We've updated the digital learning plan, and we've also, to help, to help our LEAs and our charter schools as they complete their digital learning plan progress rubric, we've partnered with the Friday Institute to develop a series of wraparound materials to support the teams at the district and charter level as they complete that rubric. And this next bullet I'm very proud of, this is the CEDL certification. CEDL is your Chief Education Technology Leader Certification. It is from the Professional Organization for School System Technology Leaders, COSIN. And we, I put here that we were top, but we got edged out by Texas um, just recently. We were top in the nation um, on our number of technology leaders who are certified, but now we have been um, beat out just a little bit by Texas. So uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. We hope to take that edge again. Um, but we have 54 certified educators, technology leader educators in the state now. And then where we're going to focus a lot of the time today is some of the affirmative outcomes of our digital learning initiative grants. And as I alluded to earlier, 94% of our grant awardees said that they felt like they were more prepared for remote instruction. So we're going to dive in now and look at some of those outcomes. So I'm going to turn this over to Lindsay. Lindsay. Thank you so yes. much. On the next slide, we'll take a few moments to dive into the alignment of the State Board of Education's 2025 strategic plan and how well it aligns to the Digital Age Learning grant Initiative grants. So if we look at goal one, eliminating opportunity gaps by equitable access to technology and professional learning, the Community School of Davidson was recently awarded a 2020-2021 grant and they have designed their grant to provide equitable access to technology, connectivity, as well as ongoing professional learning. Looking at goal two, which is improving school and district performance, specifically objective one, which prioritizes access to technology resources, devices, and professional learning. Hyde County Schools was awarded a 2018-2020 implementation grant. And during the course of these two years, Hyde spent um, $49,671.66 on hardware and software. District leaders spoke about how the DLI funds for Chromebooks, Canvas, and Seesaw was the reason that they were able to send students home with devices during the pandemic. The DLI designed to support each objective in goal three due to the work of focusing on personalized learning, 
micro-credentialing, student-centered learning, and education. There are many examples of this level of support happening all for all the grant recipients. In the spring of 2020, Davie County Schools transitioned their grant focus to all online PD, employing their teachers as PD leaders and digital teaching and learning mentors within their schools and districts. As a result, they created the hashtag Go Digital Davy event, which focused specifically on preparing teachers to instruct and engage remotely. The event more than 700 teachers and staff from Davy County equipping staff with tools to engage students in a remote environment, organizing and managing their online classroom platform, as well as ways to personalize learning for students. Rowan County Schools is a current Innovation Academy grant recipient, and due to the pandemic, they also transition their professional learning online. Let me take a moment to share these statistics with you. They completed over 50 webinars. They had over 7,000 views to recorded webinars. They held five live Wednesday webinars with over 5,000 staff attending. And they had over 30,000 views to their PD guidebook that they created. And over 2,700 completed classified modules and micro-credentials. So the map that you see now, if you wouldn't mind showing the map, there we go. On the map that you see now, you can see, um, this is just for the digital age learning grants, where the counties, where the recipients are located. Where you see multiple dots inside of one county, that represents LEAs, charter schools, lab schools, and uh, you can actually click on those. Each DLI grant recipient creates an infographic of their work where they highlight what they did and what were the outcomes and impacts. The reason we require them to do that is because we want to spur innovation and make sure that they have information that they can share and that it's replicable to others who might want to duplicate what they are doing. And so I want to mention that these grants are not large amounts. The planning grant is $50,000 and the implementation grant is $75,000 over two years. So sometimes for very large districts, um, that, that might not be enough to impact. So um, you see that a lot of our small districts take advantage of these and they have had tremendous impact in our smaller districts to sustain a lot of their work with digital age teaching and learning. Next slide. On, the on this slide, we have provided a breakdown of focus area, dollars allocated, and the total number of grant recipients for each iteration of the Digital Age Learning Grant. Since 2017, we've had a total of 76 grant recipients, all 76 focused on personalized learning, 41 also focused on micro-credentialing to enhance personalized learning within their public school unit, and 35 grantees focused on digital learning competency modules. On the next slide, you will see examples of infographics and quotes from the 2019-2020 grantees. These can also be found, like Dr. Wren said, by hovering over each icon on the map that's found on slide four. I encourage you to view those infographics when your time allows. Each grant recipient creates an infograph to highlight digital learning, micro-credentialing, collaboration, and the sharing of innovation that has occurred within public school units. Before, I would like to take a look at the next slide, and I would like to read this impactful quote from Duplin County for you all. Several of our goals of the grant help prepare our district for remote instruction, such as blueprint math courses, professional development, micro-credentials, modeling classroom rooms and device devices. By creating the Math Blueprint course, teachers had ready access to an online Canvas course so they could continue to teach. So it's my pleasure to turn the next part of this presentation over to Dr. Scott Smith and Ms. Tracy Wade from Mooresville Graded District. 
Thank you, Dr. Wren and members of the board. It's an honor to present to you today on behalf of Mooresville Graded. And as Dr. Wren said, we are one of those smaller school districts that uh, benefited greatly from, from the grant on personalized learning. Uh, next slide, please. The purpose for our grant in Mooresville, we are an established one-to-one. -one, and when we got the grant, we were in our 12th year of a one-to-one -one where every student has a device and every staff member has a device. But we wanted to um, be intensive on our professional development around the use of technology in our digital age. Um, we have done great work and we wanted to extend that work um, with the digital teaching and learning grant. Um, we were able to host meetups or uh, PD sessions with our teachers. We created online asynchronous modules. We did micro-credentialing and badging for our teachers. We were able to send our teachers to NC Ties for two years. Actually, NC Ties just uh, was the week right before COVID hit. So uh, we sent a lot of teachers right uh, to NC Ties this year. And then they came back and shared out those strategies with the rest of our staff. We were also able to offer intensive per personalized technology plans for our teachers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. In addition, the district was switching over our learning management system to the state-run instance of Canvas. So we had a lot of uh, emphasis on PD for Canvas. Go ahead to the next slide, please. If you look at this by the numbers, um, Mooresville has approximately 400 staff, uh, certified staff in our district. And with this grant, we were able to do a 10 hour Canvas course and also PEAK, which is performance excellence for all kids, training for all certified staff. This was one of the things that was not an option and everybody um, partook uh, of, of these PD sessions. We were also able to get 42 educators who earned uh, badging on all 10 modules. We were able to offer 50 different topics and over 600 attendees, and I know that's more staff than we have. And part of those other 200 came from 12 other districts who came to learn lunch and learn opportunities um, here in Mooresville. Um, where we were able to uh, talk about how we were using digital teaching and learning, the strategies we were implementing. Um, we did focus on the reading and technology uh, all at one time. We did, as I said, send educators to NC ties, uh, 25 in the first year and 30 in the second year. We did were able to create 775 online PD courses for virtual learning. Um, that were created this year. 16 teachers participated in that personalized technology plan that I uh, mentioned earlier. And then five of our, of our school library media coordinators served as the mentors for those PTP participants uh, this past year. Overall, this year, we, we were able to switch some things around, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, but 197 of our, of our secondary teachers re received virtual classroom training in March. And that was due to the COVID shuffle. Um, we all talked about how we, we pivoted and moved, moved things around this year and the transitions that have happened. So we were able to uh, renegotiate some of our, our grant funds to support some different things um, that were able to, we were able to do more virtual options. So we replaced some of these in-person meetings with Google Meets. We did video recordings of those meetups for on-demand PD. We actually had an increase in buy-in for attending this PD, and we had more teachers participate in the remote sessions than we did in the previous sessions. Again, as an established one-to-one, -one, we were familiar with the technology and moving to the remote option after um, COVID was not as big of a, a heavy lift for us as some others, but we still needed to address our teachers teaching in the virtual um, environment. So we were able to adjust those content offerings um, and make it uh, much more attractive for our, our teachers. We were able to create extensive asynchronous PD choice boards for all of our staff in the summer um, in preparation for, for this fall. At this time, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Tracy Wade. She is our uh, secondary education and curriculum coordinator. And I did want to say one more comment to uh, Dr. Wren's slide up at the beginning. Uh, Ms. Wade and I are both proud um, CETL 
uh, certified um, instructors that the state was able to, to offer and help us with that uh, certification. So, Ms. Wade? Thank you, Dr. Smith. So, I'll talk a little bit about the pivot that Dr. Smith mentioned as we headed into March. We happened to be on uh, spring break when our school closure was initiated. So, our district decided to take an additional week to prepare for that shift into remote learning. Particularly at our secondary level, we were planning to have asynchronous uh, instruction as well as synchronous instruction. So that planning for remote instruction required us to complete our instructional model. Uh, and throughout that process, we wanted to show grace for our teachers and our students and what we were going through, but also make it clear that there were uh, expectations that teaching and learning would continue and this would now have to take place in a digital environment. And this was also applicable to our elementary schools, although we did not do uh, synchronous with our elementary this spring. We had such success as a result of this grant that we decided to build that into our remote learning plan for this fall, and it has been highly successful. So we wanted to provide support for our teachers on the tools and the instructional strategies that would be most necessary for this new environment. It was really important to us that we develop the just-in-time PD that was not overwhelming. This was not the time to introduce a gazillion new tools that might not work. And so we really tried to focus on best practices that we had been honing through our grant work for the last two years. Dr. Smith mentioned our teachers who had gone through our micro-credentialing process, and we really leaned on them to develop this PD in a very short span of about two weeks to get our teachers off the ground. And so we developed some around what your virtual classroom could look like, how to use some of the new tools that we were asking them to use, such as Canvas conferencing and uh, Google Meet. And we pushed that PD to our teachers through our teacher leaders that we had identified through the grant. If you'll go to the next slide, please. After our spring experience, we found that we had a lot of uh, very positive feedback from our teachers and our parents and our students about that. And we decided to use our summer and some additional money that we had from the grant that we weren't able to use due to travel and other restrictions to really prepare our, our families and our teachers for the long haul of remote learning in the fall. And so over the course of the summer, we used our grant funding with some CARES money to provide an intensive summer training related to digital learning. We used our lessons from the spring to decide what those courses were going to be. We were focusing on all content areas, not just math or literacy. In particular, we wanted to teach uh, some skills related to how do you build relationships in virtual uh, setting? How do you have a first day of school when you've never met your students? We were very lucky spring that our teachers and students already had established relationships and we think that really helped with our engagement in the spring and then with the support from the grant our teachers were were able to to make that pivot very quickly but this was kind of a new game for us and figuring out how do we start school virtually and so we we used our grant money to pay um, our teacher leaders that we had identified through the grant to really focus on those survivor skills for digital learning we, of course, needed to continue growing with Canvas. We had a large amount of new staff coming into our district. We needed to make sure they were supported and were able to reach the same level of competency in teaching online that existing staff had. And one thing that we noticed was that as a result of the grant, we had a really great level of buy-in because our teachers had really appreciated the focus from back in March that we we're only going to give them the PD and the tools strategies that were kind of mission critical at this point. We didn't want to overwhelm them. And that really increased, I think, the buy-in that our teachers had. And we had great support from our central office and our school-based leaders to make sure that all of our teachers created a minimum number of uh, PD modules related to differentiated core, related to engagement, and then also SEL. And so this group many was really pivotal for us on on developing ways that we could build engagement and collaboration into our live synchronous sessions. And as you can see from the examples here, we really wanted to expand that beyond kind of our core areas because a lot of our, our teachers needed to be specific to their course that they teach. How do I teach automotive or band in a remote environment? And this grant allowed us to do that. If you'll go to the next slide, you'll see some additional ways uh, our grant allowed us to be ready for remote learning. 
Canvas PD sessions that were required for all of our teachers in year one, this by far was probably the most critical indicator of our success in the spring. We had already established a benchmark of Canvas skills and competency, and we're really able to build into some of those advanced engagement features and differentiation pieces that Canvas offered. If we had not had that PD to fund that to make it required for all staff, it definitely would not have gone as well for us in the spring. Dr. Smith mentioned that NC Ties attendance literally was uh, the week before our, our closure for us, week before spring break. We had teachers come back from that who were already primed and ready to present on what they had learned. And there was certainly a very high level of interest from the rest of our staff in hearing what those uh, teachers, coaches, and administrators had learned from all leaders across the state. And, and there was a, a built-in audience for that as we shared those lessons throughout the spring uh, to our teachers. Over 100 of those differentiated modules that I had mentioned earlier. And again, our teachers were able to take advantage of that this summer. So although this was a small amount of money for you all, it really was just a huge impact for us. And we are just so grateful uh, that we were able to have this money and truly every single certified educator in our district was able to benefit from it. If you'll go to the next slide, you'll see some of the reflections from our PTP, our Personalized Tech Plan participants. I just want to point out this one um, quote in, in blue here. I feel like I have thoroughly grown as a teacher with using technology. I feel more willing to take risks on activities and ideas that I may have been a little more nervous to try before. And I must say that as a mature one-to-one, -one, this was really what we needed to happen. We needed our teachers to step out of their complacency and, and comfort and really start to to reach for those uh, fine-tuning practices that we want. So we are still remote at this point for six, 12 and have been um, all semester. We are doing one day a week in person. And again, without this grant, we would have been um, in a much different place trying to build our, our remote learning plan. So I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Next slide, we're not actually going to go over, but it is a video that uh, gives you a K-12 glimpse of what virtual learning looked like in our district. And you'll kind of see the different ways that our teachers have incorporated technology. Um, so whatever your grade level is, there will be lots to choose from. But thank you again for the opportunity to share. And also, we are one of those districts who has received a second grant. And we will be continuing this work on for the next two years. So we are, uh, just, again, very grateful for your um, your to for this purpose. It does truly make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Ms. Wade. I failed to mention that Dr. Smith is co-chair of the North Carolina Coast and Chapter, and he worked really hard with his other co-chair, Marlo Gaddis, to bring a Coast and Chapter to North Carolina to um, lead our technology leaders across the state. And I forgot to mention that I am also a CEDL certified technology leader, and uh, I can say it was one of the most rigorous certifications I've ever earned. And um, so I'm very proud of that certification. Um, so now I want to turn it over to Granville County Public Schools and Dr. Elisa McLean, Superintendent, and Dr. Michael Myrick, Assistant Superintendent, and Mrs. Gwen Lofton, who is the Technology Director in Granville County Public Schools, is going to share with you now their experiences with the Digital Learning Initiative grant and some of the affirmative outcomes from them. So, Dr. McLean? Thank you so much, Dr. Wren, and good morning, Chairman Davis and members of the board. I am Elisa McLean, the proud superintendent of Granville County Public Schools. On behalf of our board, we are delighted to be with you this morning because we're able to do some exciting things in Granville County as the result of this DLI grant, the planning and the implementation grants, which we've been fortunate enough to receive the last couple of years. They have allowed us to do some amazing work, including to just get our wings under us instructionally, doing some contemporary things in regards to professional development with micro-credentialing, Google certifications, as well as applying emerging technology in our classrooms. Student engagement is big in our district. And because of the DLI grants, student engagement has improved as the result. It has been incredible in our district with new ways of reaching our pupils. So when COVID-19 hit, 
Because of the DLI grant work that was already underway, we had boots on the ground in many of our schools across the district with remote learning and support for our teachers, asynchronously and synchronously. And we are most appreciative of the opportunity. We have a repertoire of materials available and we have experts now in various areas. So I'm here to say thank you this morning. Just know the impact has been great in Granville County Public Schools. I now would like to turn it over to my colleagues, our wonderful technology director, Ms. Gwen Lofton, and our incredible assistant superintendent for CNI, Dr. Michael Myrick. I will come back to you at the end because we brought along some little visitors with us to also say thank you. Gwen, take it away. Thank you, Dr. McLean. So on your screen now, you'll see an overview of what we were able to accomplish with the last grants that we received. So in 2017, 2018, we received a planning grant and then in 2018, 2020, an implementation grant. And I'm not gonna read these numbers to you, but I encourage you to take a look at all that we were able to accomplish with these funds. But I do wanna highlight a couple in particular. You'll notice that we did um, emphasize Google certification. So between level one and level two, we had a total of 90 Google certifications happened in our district thanks to the grant funds. We also focused on professional development for our teachers. You can see we had Beyond the Chalk come out on site a couple of times. And just like Mooresville Greater School District, we were able to send our teachers to NC Ties, the big technology conference in downtown Raleigh. And they were so appreciative of the professional development they were able to receive around technology. Another thing that we did in our grant that the teachers greatly benefited from was we gave them money for emerging technology. So each teacher, as you can see, it's the last bullet point underneath implementation grant. Each teacher was given $1,000 each year of the implementation grant to choose items that they would like to add to their classroom. That would be emerging technology. We'll give you some examples of those shortly. Um, but those were items that ended up lending themselves well to the transition we made to virtual learning. The last thing I want to point out on this slide is um, we did really emphasize micro credentials in the implementation grant. You can see that we had 46 teachers, teachers assistants or administrators achieve 4C micro credentials. We did that in partnership with the Friday Institute. And these focused on the four C's, which you likely know is communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Our most recent grant, the implementation grant, you can see our cohort of teachers. So with the planning grant, we had 60 teachers, and then we shifted to really honing in on just the cream of the crop of those 60. So our implementation grant had 30 teachers in the cohort. And in this picture, Back pre-COVID, uh, you can see us gathered here in front of our central office, and this is where they were honored at a board meeting. But I wanted you to know the goal of our implementation grant was to create 30 gold star classrooms, is how we coined the phrase, where they were creating student-centered classrooms that focused on those four C's that I just mentioned. So we were really trying to pour and invest into these teachers, give them the technology they needed, the professional development they needed in order to transform their classroom to a digital age one. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Myrick, and he'll share a little bit more about how all of this prep work lended itself well to the quick shift to remote learning. Good, good morning, and thank you, Ms. Lofton. So back in the spring, when we were charged with moving from face-to-face -face learning to um, remote learning, one of the first things that we did, we contacted our Digital Stars teachers, um, especially those that had earned the certifications, and we just tasked them with creating some model lessons to share with our teachers across the district. And they did that with, with great enthusiasm. And with, a, and with those teachers being able to do that, even though our whole district was not a part of the digital learning grant, our entire district benefited from the grant because our teachers were able to provide model lessons and from those model lessons, we were able to create professional development opportunities where teachers could actually see what a classroom could do. And some of the resources that we mentioned earlier were that the teachers were able to buy with the funds that they received, the, the emerging technologies. Even though our, all of our teachers didn't have those emerging technologies, 
our digital stars teachers through these videos were able to show them how they could modify some of the things that they did have in order to make that happen in their classroom. We've created um, shared YouTube video um, playlists and tutorials and the highlighted blue um, sections. If you when you get an opportunity, you can just take a look at those and you will kind of get an idea of some of the things that we did around our model virtual lessons as well as our YouTube um, playlist tutorials. They were the playlist tutorials are quick um, tutorials where a teacher or a staff member can just kind of click on and maybe learn in three to five minutes something that they didn't know. Go to the next one. So in sharing the web, we were able to not only share with our teachers, but also get the word out into our community because this was a new learning environment for not only our teachers, but for our parents as well. So through our parent university, we were able to, and we are continuing to provide um, parent outreach opportunities for our parents to log in, to kind of get an idea of how to help their students learn in this environment. The link to our GCPS Remote Learning Hub is a list of tutorials, sort of like our video playlist where parents can log in and, and just type in a topic that they want to learn more about, choose that topic, and then there's a video that comes up that will show them exactly what they need to do. And at the bottom of the screen, the clips just shows you a little bit about what you will see in our playlist tutorials. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it now back over to Dr. McLean um, a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Myrick. We're going to share a few of our friends with you, but before we do that, we again want to say thank you for this opportunity. We're most grateful because the DLI grants have allowed us to sort of honor our district motto, which is to stay on the move. And we know with this new way of teaching and learning, whether our youngsters are in our classrooms or whether they are being taught remotely, student engagement remains key. Here's a little video. Thank you once again for having us this morning.
We would like to take a moment to thank you for your continued support of the Digital Age Learning Initiative grants and allowing North Carolina public school units across North Carolina to be change agents and leaders when it comes to digital age, personalized learning, quality professional development, micro-credentialing, collaboration, innovation, innovative technologies, and so much more. During the 2019-2020 school year, the DLI grants provided over 9,382 teachers across the state of North Carolina with professional development that equipped them with tools to engage students in a remote learning environment, organize and manage their online classroom platform, ways to personalize learning for students, how to utilize technology in the classroom, innovative digital teaching and learning practices, and so much more. Thank you again. I hope this helped you see some of the connections between the digital learning initiative and what is actually happening um, in, in down to the student level and the impact it has. We appreciate your support and helping us to continue this funding, and uh, we look forward to continue to bring you updates. Are there any questions? I'd just like to say thank you to all of the leaders that we have heard from this morning on this work. It has never been more relevant than it is right now, and it is going to continue to be critical to the success in our classrooms across the state. So thank you so much for being on the forefront of this work. Thank you, Ms. Kamnitz. That concludes our presentation, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kamnitz, and we extend our thanks to all members of the DPI team and our congratulations to Orsville and Granville for being such terrific examples of what we can accomplish together for our students by advancing the use of technology. I'd also like to extend our appreciation to uh, Lieutenant Governor Forrest for his leadership of the Digital Learning Initiative. Governor Forrest leadership, Lieutenant Governor Forrest leadership that um, ensured we covered the last mile to connect every school with every student across our state and providing a roadmap for us to continue to use as a model as we move forward with extending the use of technology for all of our students. So our appreciation to you, Lieutenant Governor Forrest, for your leadership in this effort. At this time, we'll move forward with the Educator Standards and Practice Committee, and I'll call on the chair of that committee, Dr. Olivia Oxendine. Thank you, Chair Davis. This is Olivia Oxendine, chair of the ESNP Committee of the State Board of Education, and joining me in the leadership role is Ms. Amy White. Uh, this morning, I have four items to present to the board. The first item is a new business item, the teacher working condition survey update, I'm very pleased to say this is an extension of the annual report that was presented to the board a few months ago. Uh, the question that um, seemed to create a theme around the data is where, what else can we do with the data other than providing an annual report to the state board and to um, educators around North Carolina. If you recall, Dr. Grimacy, the superintendent of Moore County Schools uh, presented to the board and discussed uh, his system's approach to utilizing, incorporating, and uh, activating the data so that it would not just remain sterile and static. So today's presentation is going to, I hope, cause us to be creative in our own thinking about where to go next, what districts can do. Um, just to you know just to apply our sharpest innovative skills around making the data uh, uh, convert to uh, outcomes for kids so presenting will be <clears throat> dr martin she has just been amb as, as as ambitious as anyone uh, around where to go next with this so i will turn the presentation over to dr martin 
Thank you, Dr. Oxendine. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna defer to my assistant director, Mr. Alessandro Montaneri to kick us off and I'll come back to help answer questions. Good morning, Superintendent Johnson, Chairman Davis, Vice Chair Duncan, State Board members and advisors. As Dr. Martin pointed out, I'm Alessandro Montaneri, Assistant Director of District and Regional Support. We can go to the next slide. As Dr. Roxadine mentioned, today we have our follow-up uh, to our June North Carolina Teacher Working Conditions Survey. Uh, we're gonna go into a deeper dive into the data. Um, as Dr. Martin and Dr. Emery mentioned in yesterday's presentation uh, of our DRS work, uh, North Carolina Teacher Working Condition is part of our statewide uh, services support. Uh, this presentation has been divided into three parts. Um, I'll start it off with a summary of the June presentation since it's been a couple of months and just uh, discuss what data uh, has been available to not only us at DPI, but also uh, district leaders across North Carolina for the past five months. Uh, then uh, we're fortunate to have Dr. Emily Davis uh, from the Center for Optimized Learning Environment that will present all the new data uh, that uh, district leaders will be receiving this morning. Uh, after this presentation is over. Uh, and then last but not least, Dr. Martin will come and announce our North Carolina Teacher Working Conditions Survey winners for 2020. <clears throat> Just a reminder of, our, of uh, some notes here on our North Carolina Teacher Working Conditions Survey. Uh, this happens every two years. Uh, it's been going on since 2002. Uh, this is actually the 10th iteration of the survey. Um, it is completely funded separately uh, from DPI budget, uh, North Carolina continuing budget. Um, we have had conversations, Dr. Oxen and the committee of how can we possibly maybe even do the survey on a yearly basis. Um, I know there's also been a lot of conversation at, at the state board in the past five or six months all about uh, increasing student voice in our state uh, and possibly looking at a student version of a survey. Um, this is uh, one of the many pieces of data that schools and districts have available to them as they're working on their school improvement plans, as they're working on those equity plans and any other uh, pieces that are necessary uh, to make important decisions to improve student learning in our schools. Next slide. I'll just uh, remind everyone of the second bullet that's here. Uh, the, the biggest change in 2020 was that we added two sections. Uh, we had a, a section of questions related to school safety, and we also had a section related to equity in our survey. And you'll see that in some of the data presented later. <clears throat> the good news is that even though we were definitely battling uh, the beginning of the COVID pandemic at the time that the survey rolled out, uh, we did have 94.5% of our schools uh, reach that minimum response rate threshold. Um, as you can see uh, above in this picture, we had 102,545 educators, 84.45% uh, respond to the survey. Just a breakdown of who those ed educators were. Uh, 90,000 of them were teachers and around 12,000 were administrators. And then to discuss some of the information that's been available for the past five months before I hand it over to Dr. Davis. <laughs> You should have all received uh, this infographic, uh, which just summarizes some of the key points of that presentation in June. I'm just gonna go over a couple of these just as a reminder. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we see um, that 89% of teachers uh, responded uh, and 93% of principals responded this desire to stay working in education in North Carolina. Uh, that's definitely uh, good news. Uh, on At the very, bottom of that, there's a pie graph which uh, discusses the importance of school leadership um, and, and how our educators that responded to the survey uh, basically rated that as the number one reason uh, for continuing to stay working at his or her school. Um, 
on the on the right side of the on the back of your infographic on the right side of this slide uh, when we talk about bullying and the questions that had to do with that um, our educators across North Carolina responded that race ethnicity and cultural background according to them is is perceived as the number one uh, reason for bullying in our schools uh, and then last but not least when it comes to the equity section of our which was new this year um, you will notice that um, only 70% of educators believe that school rules are applied equitably to all students uh, in our schools. <laughs> Again, our survey this year took, everything took place at this new website, uh, asknc.com, asqnc.com. That is still available for schools and anyone that wishes to see the data broken down by each school. There are all types of different reports that are available. Next slide. Um, again, you can search by school, you can search by district. There's a individual item analysis available for every single school, traditional, charter, lab, any. There's also historical comparisons, uh, percentage of agreement reports available to everyone that wants to go to the website. <laughs> And then the website also contains additional resources that we have made available to our schools and districts to help them use the data uh, for school improvement planning. And these are just some samples of what's available. Now, until now, the only extra data that superintendents and districts had available, which was distributed out in June, were these construct average comparisons by region, uh, where a district leader would, would is would, received uh, a spreadsheet uh, which actually compared every district in the region according to the overall composite and the uh, nine different uh, constructs that were available in the teacher working condition survey. They also received, on the next slide you'll see, the same comparison, but of all their schools in their region. Uh, now we are excited uh, to release a lot more data today. Um, when Dr. Emily Davis uh, now comes, um, she works with the Center for Optimized Learning Environments. They are our partners in everything related to the survey. Um, in her slides, you will see uh, samples of statewide scatter plots are available to all of us at DPI and state board members receive a copy just comparing com uh, where we can see how all 115 districts compare uh, for each of the construct averages. Um, we can also, uh, every superintendent and district leader will receive scatter plots uh, that show how their schools uh, compare uh, regarding those construct averages. In addition, we're going to show you uh, a connection to the November State Board presentation of last year, which talked about the Ingersoll research and the importance of teacher voice in our schools. Uh, you will see that in a comparison of low performing and non low performing schools. Um, and then she'll get into discussing teacher retention and beginning teacher data. And we will finish the presentation showing you data, uh, regional breakdowns of the sections in the, in the survey that had to do with safety, equity and hunger. Dr. Davis, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's such an honor to be here with you this morning and to present some of this new data that I hope that you will find to be as interesting and useful um, as we have found it to be. So the first set of slides that we're going to take a look at are a set of scatter plots, um, as we talked about earlier. So um, if you take a look at this one, for example, you'll see that this is an overall composite scatter plot showing all districts in the state. The, um, the y-axis is the rate of agreement, um, and the x-axis is the rate of uh, change, a rate of agreement change since the 2008 survey. So our hope always is that districts are moving up and to the right on this particular scatter plot. Um, so if you take a look at this one, for example, you'll notice that there uh, are, most of our districts are doing that for sure. Um, you'll see that, for example, when we look at these particular scatter plots, it might be particularly interesting to look at some of the districts that are falling 
far to the right and far to the left, for example, like Hamden or Graham, as they might be doing some very interesting things overall that it would be important for us to know more about. Similarly, it's important to note that districts that tend to fall in the bottom left quadrant of this particular scatter plot and all the scatter plots that we're going to look at are ones that may be struggling in some particular areas and actually often are schools that are already being labeled as low performing or recurring low performing. The next slide, please. So this is another example of a particular construct scatter plot. So in this case, it's our managing student conduct um, scatter plot. So if you are less aware, this is a construct that takes a look at how clear our um, expectations are for student conduct, how well students are following the rules, faculty understanding of those policies, et cetera. Um, so note that the, the access um, scales change a bit as you look at each scatter plot, as do the state averages. Um, those are the blue lines that run through the middle of the graphic. And again, you can look to the far top right quadrant and see districts like Tyrell, for example, that may be doing some really interesting things. They've made big change. They're moving to the right on the scatter plot that would show us some interesting data, as opposed to districts, perhaps in this case like Asheville, that are um, moving in the wrong direction, potentially on change, and are not showing as high of a rate of agreement. So there might be some important things we would need to look at there. Uh, here's another example. This one is the construct of time, which takes a look at several questions related to um, how, uh, how time is being spent in classrooms with colleagues, how minimal disruptions are, whether teachers feel that they have adequate time to do the work that they like. Um, again, looking at districts that are trending up and to the right could be particularly important. We know that these are folks who are making gains since 2018, so it would be critical to know a little bit more about that versus districts that are falling down into the left. Um, that might tell us something different that they need to be working on in this case. And one more, this is a construct of community support um, and involvement. So again, this is a construct that takes a look particularly at how involved parents and guardians are in schools and how comfortable they feel participating, how much they know about the system and the communication back and forth. Um, and again, we could see, for example, that districts like Clinton might be doing some things that would be really important for us to know more about that we could learn from, as opposed to districts that might be in the bottom left category. Um, though I would like to point out that even districts that are in the bottom right category um, might be interesting for us to know. Their trend, they've made big change. They may not yet be above the average, but they're doing the right things. So these would be important for us to unpack a little further. We are particularly appreciative of Henderson County Schools for giving us a couple of scatter plots to look at at the district level so you can get a sense of what those might look like. So in this case, again, this is the construct of teacher leadership. We know that this is one of uh, Dr. Ingersoll's important um, categories in our TWC survey. And again, we might look at schools like CCE, um, and wonder a lot about the things that they might be doing um, as opposed to schools that might be in the bottom left quadrant. These kinds of scatter plots are going to be particularly valuable for district superintendents because they might give us a quick indicator of which schools are already doing things that we could learn from within a similar context within a particular district that other, dist other schools in the district could learn from. Next slide, please. Great. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and here, one last scatter plot we have is an example from Henderson. So thanks again to Henderson for this. This one is around the construct of instructional practices. Again, a really important one. Are teachers able to work in PLCs to design and align instructions? Do they have the supports they need to turn that into effective instruction in the school? Um, and again, this one, we can see that most of the schools in the district are trending above the line and to the right on the scatter plot, which is a very positive trend overall and something that the district should be applauded for. Um, and again, there may be 
uh, a school or two that may need to be looking at what the preponderance of other schools in that particular district are doing and think about how they can learn from those. And so it gives the superintendent and the school leaders some very pointed information um, about where to aim their, um, their supports. Just as a reminder from the June presentation, Dr. Ingersoll's research shows that these five elements in the TWC survey are connected, that are connected with teacher leadership and school leadership are strongly connected to student achievement and teacher retention. So we know that, we know that the board is really interested in using research as a lens to look at school improvement strategies this year, especially in the persistently low performing schools and districts. And so this data, especially in these constructs, provides us with a really clear roadmap for assistance teams to target areas that we know from the research will make a difference. Also, these constructs are very closely connected with North Carolina's ESSA plan and its equity focus, which allows for even further alignment between the data and your goals, which of course leads to increased impact. So this targeted support is exactly what DPI has started to do, as we will see in the next couple of slides. All right, um, so in the next series of slides, we're gonna take a look at some data sets that um, are um, just about to be distributed by DPI to the LEAs as part of phase three of our work together. So each district is gonna receive its own findings for its own set of schools, um, showing data for all of the schools which met that response threshold. So they had to have at least 40% of teachers um, and educators in the school responding and at least five responses in order to show up on the particular data charts. Um, these data charts, if uh, you haven't had a chance to look at them, they are manipulatable and sortable file files so the school leaders can move things around in order to use them in the way that makes best sense for them. They do utilize this heat map quality, so it's incredibly easy to look at the data very quickly and to notice where their areas of strength. Um, ones that are in the blue and maybe into the green categories versus ones that may need some additional assistance in the yellow, orange, and red categories. Um, so on this particular chart, you'll see that the, the data is broken out into these two major categories that Dr. Ingersoll has recommended as important areas to focus on of school leadership and teacher decision-making items. Um, so you could see that there's a lot of blue, particularly on the school leadership side, which is definitely something to celebrate on this particular slide and for this particular example district. And it's already very easy to see that under teacher leadership, um, there are, there's a lot more orange and yellow, and that this may be an area of focus that's necessary at a district or LEA level. Um, and then you could also look kind of across schools and see, for example, um, that elementary school that has more yellow and red, that might be a school that is going to need some additional support on all of these constructs um, versus a school that has more blue, which might be a school that could be learned from in this particular district. Um, our hope is that this will help the LEA leaders to identify schools that are using more successful strategies within their own district to assist other schools in the district that are maybe not currently finding as much success. And again, the toolkit is available on the website, which can guide leaders through the process of identifying areas um, and planning out next steps based on this important research aligned data. Next slide, please. All right, so here is a second example from one low performing district. Um, again, the heat map makes it exceptionally clear the areas for improvement both across the whole LEA and in individual schools. So think about how you, if you were a superintendent or if you're a school leader, you can use this information really easily to help make data and research-driven decisions um, pretty quickly. Next slide. You will also be able, by looking at the data, be able to compare both low performing schools across the state to those that are not low performing schools across um, all constructs and overall. And again, you can see the ends there for like the total number of schools in each of those particular categories. Um, again, in this example, the areas of need become quite clear. In this case, time is a construct that seems to be a challenge across all types of schools. 
um, and managing student conduct might be an additional area, an additional construct that seems to particularly impact low performing schools. Um, and so while there's a lot of there's a lot of other green things there that might we, that we might want to address right because green suggests only a 70 to 80 percent rate of agreement we could definitely focus and target our work first on those yellow areas um, and know that those would make significant changes it's also nice to be able to look at the blue areas and know um, which ones might not require our most immediate attention so that we can aim our day, our our work in the right place thank you next slide Similarly, we can compare um, recurring low performing schools with our not recurring low performing schools. And so just as a reminder that our recurring low performing schools are those that have been in the low performing category two of the last three years. So we can take a look again. You'll notice that this, this seems to be playing out in a very similar way that time and managing student conduct are our biggest areas of need. Um, which it makes it all the clearer where to focus our targeted support for schools deemed low performing as well as recurring low performing. A new deliverable um, that you will have available to you this year is this stairs, movers, and levers chart, um, which this slide shows a portion of. Just as a reminder, um, Dr. Ingersoll defines stairs as individuals who are remaining in the same school. Movers are those who are transitioning to another school but staying in the profession. And leavers are those who are leaving the teaching profession altogether. So we know from the research that working conditions such as the ones that are spelled out in this survey um, do seem to be a key driver in teachers' decisions to stay, move, or leave from the profession. So it was incredibly important for us to be able to understand how these different groups perceive these different items in this working conditions survey and figure out how we can begin to adjust some of those perceptions um, or the conditions that lead to those particular perceptions. Um, it's really notable that stairs, if you look at these, this chart, tend to rate most questions more highly than those who are moving or leaving. So the question becomes why and how do we begin to dig in a little more around the data to ensure that we are able to adjust these kinds of perceptions in order to retain more quality teachers in our schools. So over the next four slides, we're also gonna be able to look at new teachers as a breakout group. So we're defining new teachers as anybody who has three years or less of experience in the classroom. Um, so on this chart, I, we've pulled out three questions that can show a couple of interesting things related to how new teachers are perceiving um, the questions on the particular survey. Uh, first, it's important to note that almost all new teachers agree that they have been formally assigned a mentor. Um, that is a huge win. It's not something that we see in every state. So congratulations to the state and to DPI for ensuring that this is happening. Um, as you look across these questions, you'll notice that generally there's not a lot of difference across the regions. Um, however, uh, there are a few standout things that we should probably point out. Um, there appears to be the most variation among regions on the topic of formal time to meet with a mentor. Um, and so it might be interesting to note that Sand Hills and the Northwest region seem to be doing better in this particular area. So we could definitely learn something from them about how they are manipulating schedules to ensure that new teachers have more formal time to meet with their mentor, which we know is a critical factor in the success of, of the mentoring experience. On the topic of reduced teacher workload, which is the orange on this chart, um, we notice that it's not high across the board for any of the regions at this moment. So just as a reminder that as we are continuing to try to attract and retain really high quality teachers, we know from the research and from experiences across the country that making space um, for teachers to reduce their workload, to be able to focus on the learning how to do the instruction well, does lead to improved outcomes for teacher retention and teacher quality and as a result, teacher learning, uh, student learning. Next slide. Okay, so this slide shows you an example piece of a beginning teacher summary report, which shows um, how the new teachers are answering questions at the LEA, 
region and state levels. Um, and it, you're able to kind of compare across those, um, across those categories. Um, the rate of agreement, just as, as it might be important to note in this particular instance, is the total number of beginning teachers who are selecting both quite a bit and a great deal. So we combine those two um, in order to, to indicate their rate of agreement. So again, we see, um, if you take a look at this data, we see formal time to meet with your mentor and reduce workload, again, seem to be low across the rate of, of agreement across the board here. Um, again, given the pandemic that's going on right now, these two items may be extra important for us to spend some time focusing on um, because they will impact our the state's ability to retain quality teachers um, beyond this year um, where time and um, supports are going to be particularly important. Dr. Davis, yeah. I'm somewhat reluctant to uh, pause at this point, but I have, so let me proceed. I do have a question that I'm afraid will escape me. Uh, going back to the question where, uh, in which the teacher is asked to um, respond to the following supports, and there are three categories, two of which pertain to, I think, mentors. The third yeah. is a weird. I don't see the correlation, and maybe I need to read the study um, item analysis better, more closely. I don't see a correlation, I and I, my question is validity, between two those two regarding mentors and reduced workload. Sure. So we know from Dr. Ingersoll's work that um, new teachers work best when they are provided with a package of supports. So that package of supports includes both a highly trained and qualified mentor, time to work closely with them, um, as well as other things, including time to work closely with colleagues, um, a reduced workload so that they can focus on learning to do their work well, and several other things. That each of those individually is valuable, but the some value of the collective package of supports is actually more than any of its composite parts. So they're not necessarily connected individually, like having a mentor and having um, a reduced workload aren't necessarily correlational, but the collective sum total of those things together seems to have a, a, a more significant impact on the outcome of retention um, and quality of teaching. Okay, thank you for that. that I, perhaps we can talk at a later time uh, so that I can be a little bit more clear on that particular question. Absolutely. Uh, just sure. go ahead. Proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so this is a, uh, a poll out of the overall questions that you saw on the previous slide, but for one LEA. So you get a sense of, of, of what you see in terms of the overall response rate. And again, I want to name that generally beginning teachers across the state and the region are really satisfied with supports that they're receiving from their mentor, which is incredibly positive news. And again, a testament to the system that has been built into North Carolina to support beginning teachers. Um, again, Dr. Ingersoll's research tells us that investing in high quality mentoring as a, as a part of a package of supports, as I was just speaking about, um, does tend to improve the quality of beginning teacher instruction, their retention, and in turn, outcomes for students. So, um, we just encourage continued attention to this particular area. And again, the pandemic is exacerbating this um, as it has only increased the sense of isolation that beginning teachers and all teachers feel at this point in time. Um, and the workload that all teachers are feeling, but that feels particularly weighty for beginning teachers. Next slide. So this is a piece of a report that compares beginning teacher responses on questions, again, those with three years or less of experience to those of their more veteran um, counterparts. Again, at the district in the orange, the uh, region in the turquoise and the, um, and the state level in the gray. Um, again, it's helpful to compare these areas in which beginning teachers respond, um, maybe particularly those where they respond with a lower response rate overall than their veteran teacher colleagues. Um, if these, if we are saying that these are critical components of um, of work um, at both the at the district, state, and regional levels, 
it might be important for us to think a little bit more about how we are ensuring that beginning teachers have the knowledge, the skills, the efficacy, the support to be able to feel that they can respond positively on each of these areas. So individual districts may find this particularly interesting to note where beginning teachers are feeling less confident or um, responding with a lower rate of agreement than their veteran colleagues. So for example, if you look at the first question, which is about an appropriate amount of time is provided for professional development, you'll notice that uh, beginning teachers at the district level are responding um, with a 15.6% lower response level than their veteran colleagues. So this might be a question for, for this particular district to consider about why, why are beginning teachers responding this way and what additional professional development do they feel that they might need in order to be successful in their positions. So moving on, um, we're also able to provide some data about the new constructs that were added to the survey this year around school safety and equity. So um, taking a look at this particular chart, um, we, you'll notice that we don't have comparative data from 2018, obviously, because these are new constructs, but they're still incredibly useful to provide some baseline data this year that we'll begin to add on to as the survey continues. So in this chart, we're taking a look at two questions, which are listed at the bottom of the slide here. So the one in dark blue is teachers in the school know what to do if there's an emergency, a natural disaster, or a dangerous situation. And the light blue, the school provides effective and ongoing training and safety procedures to staff. Um, so while it appears that there's little variation, if you look at the scale, it's pretty narrow on this particular chart. Um, I think it's important to notice that because this is a, a statewide, you know, just a statewide or a region wide look that even a small rate of change in the percent rate of agreement, even as little as 2%, could mean that there are hundreds of teachers who are dis disagreeing here. So it would be really critical to think about um, where, where that is occurring, um, where those teachers are working within that region who are disagreeing with this response on this particularly important topic. Um, yeah. And similarly, on this slide, um, we have three other additional questions related to safety. The, the broader prompt is that the following types of problems, the following types of problems rarely occur at our school. So we're hoping for high rates, right? Physical conflicts among students in the blue, vandalism in orange, and student possession of weapons in the gray. Um, and again, this is at the regional level, um, as you can see. So there's some standouts here. Obviously, the Northwest region and the Western region seem to be doing something really great related to reducing physical conflicts amongst students, some things that we can learn from as a state. Um, and then there are some that maybe are struggling in some of these constructs more, which you can see from looking at this particular graph. Again, at the state and region level, even small variations in the data can mean large differences in the number of teachers who are responding. So there, there is room for improvement here as well that we could talk about. On the topic of equity, um, this also gives us a really interesting set of data to explore at the LEA region and state levels. Again, this, the heat map structure of this particular table does make it pretty clear the areas that are particularly strong. I want to point out that this school emphasizes showing respect for all students' cultural beliefs and practices came across as a particular area of strength across the entire state. So that is definitely something to be proud of, followed closely by the school provides quality services to help students with social or emotional needs. So important wins there. Um, I think it's clear that the top two rows of this particular graphic, um, in particular school rules are applied equitably to all students, seems to be an area of concern amongst the takers of this particular survey. Um, and closely, uh, right behind that might be the, the first row. At this school, all students are treated equitably, justly, and fairly. These are important equity topics that um, seem to imply that there's more um, growth 
that could that could happen here, more room for conversation and professional learning potentially. So let's turn now to a discussion about student hunger. Um, on a very positive note, we want to note that this particular question had the largest rate of agreement um, percent increase from 2009 of any question on the survey. So the question is, hunger is a problem for my students, but my school uses creative strategies to combat it. So you can see the 2018 results in gray and the 2020 results um, in blue on this particular survey. Uh, again, th this is something we know that school, that student hunger is still an issue, but that schools clearly are doing something valuable to, com to combat it. Um, and I know that with the onset of the pandemic, figuring out how to feed students in the spring at the point when the survey was happening, continuing into the summer into now, um, is a huge challenge. So schools should definitely be applauded for their intentional work to make positive change on this front for students. Um, however, we know that from this graphic that hunger continues to persist as a problem um, that's impacting students. The numbers seem to be holding generally steady across most regions from 2018 to 2020. Um, looking at the data, my wondering is about what the Southeast region um, and to a lesser extent the Southwest and Western regions are doing to reduce the impact of student hunger on schools and classrooms. So that would be something very positive to explore that perhaps other regions could learn from. So as you can see, I hope from our brief presentation here today that the data from the survey provides leaders with at all levels with an, a really wide array of powerful and research aligned data that they can immediately use to drive school improvement, regional improvement, district improvement plans. Um, and that these can be harnessed using um, this particular data and the toolkit that are provided online to create a very targeted way to improve their work this year. Um, again, the data that was sent to superintendents in June and this new data that's coming out, the scatter plots, the heat maps, the bar graphs, um, these are all things that are manipulable and easily um, adjusted so that we can look at specific subgroups like beginning teachers. We can look at specific questions across schools or across regions. Um, and our hope is that this will provide um, all takers with uh, useful, useful information. Um, so thank you for your time and attention to this. I hope that you're finding this to be both heartening. There are so many positive things in this data that are worth celebrating right now. And there are very few clear indicators of things that um, could be valuable next steps based on the data that we know will play, um, pay out big dividends in the end. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Martin to finish off our section and then we can answer more questions. Thank you, Dr. Davis. And we'll just resume with Dr. Martin, unless, uh, let me pause for just a second, because this was quite a bit of data to digest or to be, to experience. So to my colleagues on the board, does anyone have a question before we resume? Madam Chair, may I? Um, yes, uh, Mr. Ford. Yeah, just, thank you so much. You may. Mr. Ford. I think we lost him. We'll come back to Mr. Ford. Anyone else have a question before we continue? If not, Dr. Martin. Okay, if we could move to our next slide, please. Uh, uh, did, I, did I get lost there? Uh, you did, I lost you. Uh, maybe no one okay. else did. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. All right, take it away, Mr. Ford. Okay, okay. I was just <laughs> talking up a storm. I was like, oh, nobody's listening. Um, so really quickly, um, the, the richness and impressiveness of this data is just, um, it's, it's astounding. North Carolina continues to lead in that regard. And so I want to uh, thank you for that. And then, of course, the, the work of Dr. Ingersoll. Uh, in particular, I'm impressed by the ability to break out various things, breaking it out by region, breaking it down by... Uh, uh, you know, new teachers versus veteran teachers. Um, and I apologize if I asked this question earlier uh, in, in, in the year and forgot, but is there a way for us to break down um, the demographics of the teacher? 
Um, and I ask that specifically because when I think about certain constructs, such as managing student conduct, for instance, right? Um, if there are particularly low or high ratings, um, is there a way for us to know, you know, what that teacher, you know, looks like, what that teacher has experienced, their, their, their constructs and everything? Because I just, we know the literature suggests that all of those things matter um, in that regard. And the other thing is, can we track the, 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 the school itself, like the urbanicity of the school, whether it's an urban, suburban or rural school, so that we can see like the variance between those things on those particular constructs. That's something we can those are fabulous questions. Um, so the survey doesn't currently ask for demographic information about from the respondents. So we do not currently have the ability to track um, data along those lines. Um, so that would be a very interesting uh, conversation for us to have further. You, you are you are more than correct about that. Um, we the survey doesn't also ask questions about the type of school apart from. Um, uh, it doesn't necessarily ask the information that would help us to know about the urbanicity or the suburbanicity of a particular school. Though, as we look within a particular district or in a particular region, we might be able to suss that out a bit um, and, and, move, and manipulate the data within the regional level based on what you know about that. Thank you so much. And if, so just let me get on record and say as a recommendation going forward as we do this uh, biannually, if, if Throwing demographic data of the teacher is a possibility in there. That'd be great. I'm all for stakeholder input, be it teachers, students, or parents. Uh, I think it just helps us get closer to um, meeting our, our overall goals. So thank you for that. And that recommendation is noted, Mr. Ford. Dr. So, uh, yes, I hear my name. This is Alan Duncan. Can you hear me? Uh, Mr. Duncan, yes. I have a question that goes to the Respondent slide, or actually three questions are related. Yeah. Um, is, is there an explanation for yeah. why in the traditional yeah. schools, 96.5% yeah. yeah. of the respondents are schools of 77 um, yeah, it's whole other schools <laughs> that <laughs> But I think that, you know. Do you have any sense for how that occurred? Um, Mr. Montanari or uh, Dr. Martin, would you like to respond to that question? So, I would, yeah, I didn't hear it. He sounds far away to me. Elizondo, did you get it? And can you respond? No, I was going to ask him if he can please re uh, repeat the question because it was really hard to hear. I heard about the 94.5%, but I didn't hear anything else. All right. We are it is the question. The question yeah. pertains to the differentiation, the differences between, I think it was the response rate for traditional public versus the charter. One is in the 90s, one is in the 70s, the latter of charters in the 70s. Is yeah. that capturing it? Actually, I've now moved to Deanne's station. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I hear you. Okay, very good. Um, so the first part of my question is, 96 and a half 77 and a 46.9 we have any uh reasons for why we had such a significant difference in the minimum response rate threshold? well um you know 40 percent is our threshold in order for schools to garner a report and um, we did have some charter schools who expressed that um you know they did not want to partake in the survey we worked closely with the office of charter school um and um Dave, uh, Mr. Machado was a great help with um, helping us with schools reaching that 40% so they could be, uh, could receive reports. So the second question is, is the data we've got that's been reported on, and thank you very much, this really is an excellent report um, and extremely helpful. Is the data we have, is it a compilation of all these three? Yes. It, okay, so we've, we're seeing all three. Is there any compilation that's broken out separately for the three? That is, traditional schools on the one hand and charter schools on the other, and then our non-traditional other schools. Is that is that data broken out so we can look at that? I would have to go back to Cole to see if that is the way that the data was broken down, but I can, I can get that. 
I hear I hear some feedback, but I would have to go to code to see um, the breakdowns of the data. Uh, in previous years, I had a compilation where the charter schools were put together as a large district, meaning all of them were put together to compare and taken away, taken out of the charter out of the traditional school comparison. So I can go back and bring that information back. Thank you. Thank you for looking for that. I think that's a worthy uh, addition to the disaggregation as well. So that recommendation is noted. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Martin, for uh, agreeing to with that. Yes. You have another question from Ms. White? For Ms. White? Okay. Uh, by all means, Amy. Can you hear me, Dr. Martin? Uh, a little bit louder might help, or closer to the mic, you might need to hug it. So my question has to um, do with Perfect. how we um, communicate trends that are um, changeable, um, particularly with uh, one of the things that I noted across many of the slides was uh, student behavior and looking at particularly our initially licensed teachers and how we might use that data to inform the training of those teachers before they ever reach the classroom. Um, time on task is critically important um, for all students in the classroom and, and, and teacher management skills are critical to making sure that time is spent on teaching and not on redirecting student behavior. So is there a mechanism and a method in place by which we can communicate trends that we're seeing um, back to EPP so that they might inform instruction? So um, my first response to that is when you first started talking and asking about trends, um, we have several feedback loops that connect to our stakeholders. For example, the regional education facilitators are tied in with our HR directors who take um, great appreciation for the data on beginning teachers or comparing um, stayer, movers, leavers, or veteran versus beginning. And then our regional case managers are great feedback loops directly to our superintendents uh, when it comes to things like the Ingersoll data and just reporting and, and filtering both ways the needs based on the data. When it comes to the EPPs, I can take note of that. That is um, very in, uh, interesting um, suggestion. Uh, we can definitely work with um, Dr. Tomberlin's group um, to, to see how we can tie all of that in. I'm typing notes frantically. That's a great, uh, absolutely great. All of these suggestions and questions are terrific. Anything else before we proceed? We're, we need to be conscious of time. If not, Dr. Martin, it's yours. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to our partners. Um, we have sponsors for the Teacher Working Conditions Survey, NCBCE, NCAE. They have been partners for many, many years, um, not only with finances, but also in helping to get the word out about the survey. Um, NC Papa, NCASA, and PENC are new partners. They've served on our um, advisory committee, but this year um, they did put forth financial contributions to um, support the uh, execution of the survey. So um, because it was a pandemic, we tried to be as fair and understanding as possible, but we did want to salute those schools that reached 100%. So we made different categories and put schools in pots and pool names, and these are our results. And we just want to say congratulations. All of the schools and districts that made 100% participation are listed on our Ask NC website. Uh, these are the locations of those who received awards pretty much all over the state. Um, fastest elementary school went to Moxville Elementary in Davie County. Congratulations. Fastest middle school to Tarbor City Middle in Columbus County. 
Fastest High School to John A. Holmes High in Edith and Shawan. And then Edith and Shawan also got fastest district. Congratulations. Next, we have my favorite award, the Nick of Time Award, and that went to, went to Banks Elementary in Lenore County. And then we had our weekly 100% drawings. We had a lot of schools in these categories, but the first week, week went to Ray Childers Elementary in Burke County. Week two went to Allerbrook Elementary in Charlotte Mecklenburg School System. Week three went to South Mar Elementary in Randolph County. Week four went to Reesville High in Rockingham County. And then we had some finale drawings. And the first one went to Stoner Thomas School in Davidson County. Then another finale random drawing went to Murphy High in Cherokee County. And then we had South Lenore High in Lenore County, who they were also finale random drawings. The newest award uh, we wanted to recognize because um, we have representatives at every school when we do TWC that we stay in constant communication. So we put all of these that made 100% and um, we recognize two rallying, rallying representatives from J John Taylor in Beaufort County, Ms. Cobb and Ms. Blank. Congratulations. Thank you for all of your feedback. I'm sure that I will continue to work with Dr. Oxendine um, and Dr. Townsend Smith to see how we can make this information um, more usable moving forward and all of the data that we have just shared with you is on its way through email to the superintendents um, that we represent thank you so much thank you dr martin mr montaneri and dr davis this was a fabulous uh fabulous presentation and i'm looking at the comments in the chat bar and ever so right um matt about this is such a, a an important piece of uh, an important tool to land in the hands and on the tables of our school improvement teams around North Carolina. If I were a principal, it would drive a two day retreat on school improvement with my team. So uh, I can't say enough, it's fabulous. Uh, I have a million questions. Maybe I'll have time to answer, uh, <laughs> to ask one half of them. So we'll just move right on. Unless board members, do you have other questions? I don't wanna shortchange your, um, ability to ask a question or make a comment. If not, we're going to move on to the next item. And it's also an issue. This is an issue session item dealing with uh, an update. It's a good juncture for Dr. Robert Sox to uh, bring us into the fold on what is happening with the uh, revisiting our principal evaluation standards and uh, at, at the right time, uh, once we the board approves those standards, or even prior to that, uh, the, the EPPs, uh, the 19 EPPs who uh, prepare our principals around North Carolina will certainly um, be brought on board with revising the principal preparation standards. So lots of work is going on, has gone on prior to this presentation. I just felt like it was time uh, that Dr. Sox come and share all the good work and the good news with the state board. So Dr. Sox, welcome and it's yours. Thanks, Dr. Oxendine. Uh, thank you also Chairman Davis, Superintendent Johnson and members of the board. As Dr. Oxendine mentioned, this is to update you on the current progress of the group that is working on assessing and refreshing our North Carolina standards for school executives. Existing standards that we have have their roots in um, the Wallace Foundation seven leadership domains. Those current seven leadership domains that are within our rubric are strategic, instructional, cultural, human resources, managerial, external development, and micropolitical. 
these um, standards that we have were um, the initial set of national standards came from the educational policy standards. They were adopted by the National Policy Board for Education Administration in 2007. And these standards were released by the Interstate School Leadership License Consortium, and they were commonly called the ISLIC standards. And in 2015, the National Policy Board for Education Administration released an updated version of these professional standards for educational leaders. Our current standards, the ones that we are operating on right now, were aligned to the expectations that were articulated in the ISLIC standards when they were originally adopted. So given the history of alignment to national standards and aware of the National Policy Board's recent release of those updated leadership policy standards in the fall of 2018, the Pepsi Commission requested a review of our North Carolina standards to assess the degree of alignment to these new standards and determine if revision might need to be considered. So in November of 2018, a variety of education stakeholders convened to begin this work. And this focus group includes members of critical stakeholder groups that um, represent school and district leaders, educator preparation program faculty, and professional organization leaders. This focus group is essentially operating as a think tank, and Dr. Shirley Prince of NC Papa helps to lead this important work. Dr. Kimberly Evans and I convene and facilitate the work that this team is, um, has started and continues to do. Early in the planning and the discussion, when the team convened, they recognized that the standards for preparing principals are inextricably linked to the expectations for practicing school leaders. So the decision was made to also include the National Education Leadership Preparation Standards, known as the NELP standards, in the initial review. It was important to begin this work with some common language to ground everyone with the same set of goals and describe the need for and purpose of standards for school leaders. So the work group established this if then statement to guide their work and it was established very early in our work. And so this purpose statement that was the guide was if the role of principals is to lead schools in a manner that equips teachers, staff, and school community with the necessary skills and resources to help all students grow and achieve appropriately. And the goal of the supervisor evaluator is to direct, lead, and coach a principal through an annual continuous improvement cycle for leadership, which includes deployment, reflection, and assessment of the tasks and strengths to do so. Then, these North Carolina school executive standards need to describe the dispositions, competencies, and expectations at an appropriate level of specificity and granularity to foster clear targets and expectations for deploying, supervising, and evaluating effective school leadership. And effective school leadership is that which equips teachers, staff, and the school community with the necessary skills and resources to help all students grow and achieve appropriately. With this in mind, there are two very important functions that these standards need to support. The first is supervision, which is the formative process of providing assistance and support to refine and improve educational practice. We typically refer to this as coaching. And then our more common use of the language, which is evaluation, which is the process of collecting and reviewing evidence of practice in order to assign a summative rating of quality. Addressing these two functions effectively requires more than just a set of standard statements. School leaders and their evaluators need systems, structures, and tools to guide and support the supervision and evaluation activities that must take place each school year. Our current system has three key components, the content, which is what to look for, the context, which is when and where to look, and the cognitive type, which is essentially the levels of the performance expectations articulated from left to right in the rubric. The alignment of the North Carolina standards to the new national standards was approached in two different ways. First, there was a high level um, review of the expectations to complete an initial high altitude language alignment. And that's what you see in the grid on the left. 
Once this alignment was conducted, the review committee used the specific descriptive language within the expectations of the standards to conduct a deeper dive alignment of these stated expectations. Both comparisons yielded similar results and aligned very closely. Equity and ethics emerged as areas where North Carolina's existing standards had some gaps. So the committee used this information to establish strategies for revision. So the considerations that the committee made for changes were to revise and align, refine and align the content by main, maintaining the high level standards domains, but we do need to combine ethics and micro-political leadership and then add equity so that it becomes the last standard. We also need to refine the language that connects school leadership to student outcomes and align the existing dispositions and competencies for successful school leadership with the standards. The committee also decided it was important to preserve and improve the context by maintaining the existing seven-step process for the annual principal and AP evaluation cycle, and then provide clear guidance, support, and resources for school leaders and their evaluators. And then finally, to adjust and edit the cognitive types that are articulated in the rubric by articulating element expectations that offer strong formative guidance for the actions of school leaders, to ensure clear alignment of the descriptors to those expectations, and to use language again that addresses student outcomes. The performance expectations should specifically support the content expectations, and we need to offer meaningful examples and artifacts in any ancillary materials that are ultimately developed. So the committee then embarked to find language to support both the supervision and the evaluation process that is that these standards are designed to support. A decision was made early on to establish a consistent element structure to support both the summative judgment and the formative support. So with this in mind, each element now in the revised um, standards ha is, has two specific parts. It has an outcome goal and an essential output. And what you see here is an example from 1B, which is leading change. And the outcome goal is to develop a culture of collaborative inquiry and problem solving for successful innovation and change. But the essential outputs, what would the evaluator do to support the principal? Those are articulated in the second half. The principal or assistant principal will establish high expectations for teachers and students identify barriers to success, and disrupt the status quo to lead systematic change efforts to make the school's structures, systems, and processes more collaborative and produce and productive for students, staff, and families. So the first half of the element statement is the summative measure, and the second portion of the element statement is the formative support and the pieces that the supervisor could support the principal or assistant principal with. Another goal was to try to develop language that was more precise and action oriented than the original language. What you see here in the gray is the existing, uh, an existing statement for school vision, mission, and strategic goals. And that existing statement is that the school's identity in part is derived from the mission, vision, values, beliefs, and goals of the school. The process is used to establish these attributes and the ways they are embodied in the life of the school community. As principals and their supervisors think about how this expectation drives the work of the principal or assistant principal, the actual language provides very little information to help them think about their goals and their structures and their strategies. So the proposed language would look more like this, to establish an educational mission that fosters a vision for successful learning and development. The principal or assistant principal will collaborate with members of the school and community to use relevant data to create and promote a shared vision for successful learning and development of each child, supported by instructional and organizational values, goals, strategies, and practices that promote and advance the academic success and well-being of each student. Again, the goal of the committee is for the language of these elements to support the principal in identifying and planning for their work and support the evaluator in assessing the outcomes of that work at the conclusion of the year and to supervise, support, and coach it throughout the year. So accomplishing this 
uh, involves adjusting and editing the levels of performance and creating some consistency in that rubric so there is clarity to the end users is very important. So the effort is to articulate the rubric descriptors along a continuum of practice. You are probably aware of the rating labels of developing, proficient, accomplished, and distinguished. The goal is to make sure that any of the um, any of the descriptors that fall into the developing category speak to understanding that a school leader must have. The descriptors in the proficient category will speak to actions that involve applying those understandings of practices. Those descriptors in the accomplished category will identify and measure the impact of having taken those actions. And then finally, the descriptors that fall in the distinguished category will articulate and define efforts that the principal has taken to systematize those actions within the building itself. With that in mind, what you have in the rubric is a continuum from the left, where it is essentially knowledge or conceptual understanding, to practice on the right, which is practical application. So a principal at the end of the year who has only a conceptual understanding would rate lower than a principal who at the end of the year had established deep practical application of those understandings and is um, achieving measurable positive outcomes from the school. So as the evaluator thinks about their role in providing that formative support throughout the year, that formative support yields and generates specific outputs or artifacts that the evaluator then uses at the end of the year to decide what that final rating is. And so the grid that you see on the screen is a scaffold that shows how the evaluator does that. When the evaluator thinks about all of the uh, evidences of practice that were collected throughout the year during that supervisory support, and they look at that set of evidences, if they can confirm from those evidences that the principal possess knowledge of appropriate practices, that principal is at least developing. When they look at that pool of evidences further, if they can determine that the principal or AP has used those practices in ways that frequently created positive conditions for success, then that principal is at least proficient. As they continue to consider that, if they identify evidence that they used those practices in ways that consistently resulted in desired outcomes at the school, then that principal would be accomplished in that element. And then finally, if they recognize within those um, examples and artifacts that that principal or assistant principal developed a redesigned systems for leading people and processes to collectively construct and achieve measurable desired outcomes, then that would be an example of distinguished performance. So there is a direct relationship between those standards and expectations for preparation of principals, as well as the standards and expectations for performance once that assistant principal and or principal has a job. And this follows that same continuum from conceptual understanding to practical application. And you see within the pre-service preparation rubric example, we have the same labels, developing, proficient, accomplished, and distinguished. But you'll notice they have shifted one slot to the left. As we think about what principals need, as they develop, they need to recognize the essential practices required for leading a school. They need to understand those practices. They need to have the skill in applying those practices. And then there needs to be visible, measurable impact from that application. So the goal of the preparation program is to help principals to develop a recognition of those practices, to practice that understanding through the internship, and then to see through that internship to what degree have they applied and impacted that. The in-service rubric still has to consider the degree to which the principal recognizes, understands, applies, impacts, or systematizes. But if a principal at the end of their preparation is proficient, meaning that they understand all of the important concepts that they need to understand, and they end their first year as a school leader, as a school leader, simply only still understanding while they were a proficient student at the conclusion of their preparation, if their practices did not improve over or change over the course of that year of school leadership, they would be a developing principal. There's a direct relationship between the pre-service rubric and the in-service rubric as those things move from conceptual understanding to practical application. So, as this committee has been working now for over a year, there is a process of engagement 
that is represented by this hourglass uh, image that you see on the screen. The first goal of this group was to gather insights and feedback from a variety of stakeholders and consider the role of standards and feedback. We've talked about those. Identify the changes that needed to take place and begin the initial draft and then the consideration of that draft. The current work exists in this center box as we are seeking critical perspectives to get feedback on this initial draft. From this, we will fine tune the draft and then at some point in the future, bring this back to uh, both the Pepsi Commission as well as the State Board of Education for your blessing and approval of those standards, at which point we will deploy those draft standards as a process for as a voluntary pilot. In that effort to seek those critical perspectives, the draft rubric and the feedback process that we have in place, um, the team developed the proposed language uh, and developed the initial draft rubric that we have right now. We have presented to the state leadership. This represents the presentation to the state board. This was presented to Pepsi actually the week that schools closed down back in March. Um, and then we are in the process of receiving feedback from various stakeholder groups. The first active stakeholder group to work on this is NC Pell, the North Carolina Professors of uh, Educational Leadership. So our current planning timeline looks like what you see on the screen. I've highlighted a couple of things to note some minor adjustments. In the 1920 school year, we worked on aligning and adjusting the standards and developing the elements and articulating the descriptors. The goal in the winter or spring was to bring a progress report to both Pepsi and the state board. It went to Pepsi in March. It is coming to you today with the goal also that in the spring and the summer, we would assess those proposed rubric standards and processes against the national standards for pers personnel evaluation. So that review against the personnel, personnel evaluation standards did not happen this summer, but it will happen this fall. As you move over to the 2020-2021, engaging those critical stakeholder groups, you see that we have a need to get feedback from superintendents, human resources, and school administrators. That principal preparation university group will be doing their review and providing feedback in November. Um, in the spring of 2021, we hope to bring a progress report back to Pepsi and the State Board of Ed. And in the summer, continue updates and recruit districts to pilot with the goal that in the fall of 2021, we could seek a voluntary pilot um, from districts that are willing to do that and collect feedback from those pilots to see if the standards need to have any uh, additional adjustments and then present those pilot outcomes to Pepsi and the State Board to seek implementation procedures and recommendations. This is actually a very timely endeavor because the Leandro report and the recommendations that came from the West Ed report actually address this specifically. There is a uh, specific recommendation to update the state's principal preparation and principal licensure requirements specifically to align with the national education leadership preparation standards. Um, and then to require principal preparation programs to demonstrate that they are preparing their students to meet these standards. So this committee actually had this work moving and in progress before this West Ed report actually was published. And there are some future considerations that need to be um, kept in mind as we move forward. That pre-service rubric alignment and articulating those expectations um, that are not currently a part of the in-service rubric. There might be implications for licensure and policy. We need to identify districts that are willing to uh, pilot the rubric when it is ready. We need to add the new rubric to the NESIS tool. So we'll need to work with the vendor so that when the pilot districts are working with it, they can take advantage of the technological tools that we have available to do so. And then how do we support and manage transition both for districts as well as principal preparation? programs. So, uh, Dr. Oxendine, that concludes the content of my report. So, I'll turn it over to you to see thank, what questions there may be. Dr. Sox, for the presentation, uh, a lot of uh, information presented there, um, much to think about. The, again, to reiterate the purpose of this presentation by Dr. Sox is to just bring to the to the fore the work that has, uh, um, has gone on and is going on around principal preparation as well, well as the evaluation of principles. Do I hear any questions from my colleagues? The, 
let me just make this one final point about the preparation, the licensure of principals in North Carolina. I can't emphasize and place enough, enough double lines under the uh, the need for revisiting licensure requirements. We no longer require a, a exam for principals in North Carolina that went away several years ago. I believe that we are probably the, if not perhaps the only state in the Southeast, there may be a couple of others, I stand to be corrected on this fact, but uh, that does not require a licensure exam. Olivia is not saying that we need to go there. Olivia is saying that we need to revisit our standards for preparing and licensing our, our licensing of principles. I'm going to share a personal bias. I I work in um, a, in a department that prepares future principals, one of the uh, 19 in North Carolina. And I say to my future principals, and some of them may be listening in this morning, my personal bias is the um, the strength and the longevity uh, and the robustness of public education, in my, in my opinion, this is Olivia, we know that the superintendent is so important. We know that classroom teacher is so important and support personnel so important, but it's that principal in that school who interfaces with parents and teachers and students and others and the community. So I, I say the public education is standing rest on the shoulders of our of our principals. They are the front line. So I um I just I just want us to be very serious and very thoughtful um, and very deliberate as we think about the licensing of principals in North Carolina. And with that <clears throat> editorializing, we'll go on to the other two items on the ESNP agenda. The next item is an action on first read. This is the teacher compensation model, uh, the report of that uh, initiative, um, teacher compensation model and advanced teaching roles. This is the pilot that we're very aware of. And Dr. Tom Berlin is going to come forward and make the presentation. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> this is Tom Tomberlin, Director of Educator Recruitment and Support, and I will be presenting this um, pre uh, this report on behalf of Dr. Uh, Dallas Tripp Stallings. Uh, so um, what I've tried to do here is take this really large report over 140 pages um, and kind of distill it down into a short presentation for you. Um, as you move through this this report and understand uh, its contents, I hope I've picked out things that are particularly um, relevant to um, the current um, state of education in North Carolina. So let me just jump right in with um, kind of an indication of how the um, report is designed. You see these icons here. These are the six major areas, I'm sorry, seven, seven major areas. Uh, that the report focuses on improvement of classroom instruction, increase school-wide student growth, increase in attractiveness of the teaching profession, recognition of high quality teachers, support for retention of high quality teachers, support for beginning teachers, and then finally scalability. As you go through the report, the sections have these icons on them so you'll know exactly what question is being answered by Dr. Stallings' analyses. Next slide. So uh, it's important to understand the data sources for this report. Um, and the first uh, of these is the impacted educator survey. This was data that was collected from the six participating districts that were in the in this evaluation. I want to remind everyone that this um, uh, this report focuses on the six original pilot programs, um, and that would be um, Chapel Hill Carborough, uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg. Vance, um, Washington County, uh, and I'm forgetting the other two off the top of my head, but uh, they are in the report, definitely. Um, so it's those six, um, and in some cases with the exclusion of two of those, and I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, educator preparation, I'm sorry, can we go, 
just quickly, yeah, the education preparation program survey. So a survey of license of teacher licensure candidates in our EPPs about the appeal of the kind of career ladders that are being created by by this program. Uh, teacher working condition survey. So we use 2016 and 18 uh, school level data for these uh, for this report. Interviews and focus groups. Uh, teachers, school, and LEA administrators from the uh, six participating LEAs and administrative data, um, LEAs impacted number of participating teachers and data from DPI. I do wanna pause for a second and recognize that Edgecombe County was one of the original six. And I hope that uh, Matt Smith will not hit send on that scathing email he's getting ready to send me. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Do advanced teaching roles improve the quality of classroom instruction? Uh, year, survey, uh, year three surveys uh, showed that more administrators answered these uh, to this question of whether this, um, this program improved the quality of classroom instruction. We had 66 in this round in year three, as opposed to 23 administrators responding in the second year. Um, despite that increase, the, the percentage of, of pr principals indicating that ATR did improve quali the quality of classroom instruction did not change. So 83% is, is still a very high number, and, and, that, and that number held uh, when we included more principals in the sample. Um, some administrators cited increased pedagogical prowess. Um, and teachers using data and goal setting as evidence that the quality of classroom instruction had improved under these under this program. Do advanced teaching roles and or related local salary supplements increase the attractiveness of the teaching profession? So teachers in the program did identify that additional compensation is important for teaching for teachers to take on additional responsibilities. Um, Teachers also expressed positive views of the career ladder um, in that it made teaching on par with other professions where advancement within that profession uh, is possible. Now, I want to I want to make sure I'm I, I'm I'm being clear here. Um, teachers see sh uh, moving from the classroom to administrative as a shift in the profession not necessarily advancement within their own profession. So this really tried to get at whether teachers saw their ability to be, uh, to advance in their profession and remain as a classroom teacher. Uh, most teachers strongly agreed uh, or agreed that, that supplemental pay was adequate, but that is down from the previous year in 92. And so that's somewhat expected as teachers um, have multiple years of, of engaging in this in this in this role. Um, the really the um, the the rigor of the role starts to um, kind of feel a little more. Um, they feel more responsibility than and then perhaps the pay is not as as um, commensurate as they would like. A great number of teachers found that the opportunity to support other teachers more important than salary differentials. And um, I think that's really important that, um, that the teachers are recognizing that their contribution to the improvement of the profession and the strengthening of the profession, um, not a majority, but a plurality of them uh, found that that was more important than the salary differential. Do the pilot programs provide recognition to high quality classroom teachers? So uh, the report does find that there's some continued tension in the selection process uh, between highly effective teachers, um, and that of course is measured by the EVOS measure, the growth model, and leadership skills. So perhaps there was uh, not enough recognition on teachers' uh, leadership skills in the selection process, um, which is very important for the role, as well as the highly effective status. Successful applicants for ATR on average have higher EVOS scores than unsuccessful applicants, but the two groups were very similar in their ratings on leadership. So all else being equal, the, the teachers with the higher EVOS scores were selected for the program, uh, even though other teachers showed similar ratings on the leadership skill. Focus, uh, focus groups indicate that transparency of the selection process for selecting advanced teaching roles is improving in the districts. 
so teachers know what the districts are looking for in these selections and they have a better um, opportunity to align their skill set with what the, what the districts are, are looking for in those roles. Do the pilot programs support retention of high quality classroom teachers? Um, now, I want to be very clear here that this is perception data. This is not data um, on actual movement of teachers out of these schools. Um, but from their perspective, a large majority of surveyed teachers um, remain consistent in their belief that advanced teaching positions would increase the likelihood of remaining in the classroom. Most teachers agree that the opportunity to collaborate will also have a positive impact on remaining in teaching. Year three saw a modest decline in the number of administrators who felt that ATR had a positive impact on teacher retention. Do the pilot programs provide assistance to and support for beginning classroom teachers? Uh, in year three, teachers continue to assert that the ATR provides support to beginning teachers. Um, beginning teachers also indicated that their lead teachers provided much better support than their regular BTSP uh, activities. And this is largely attributed to the fact that the ATR teacher is in the classroom with those teachers every day, uh, as opposed to other uh, beginning teacher support uh, opportunities. This, is a, this effect, of course, is dependent on how the ATR was designed. Um, it, the, the impact is highest when the, uh, when the ATR model does have advanced teachers working directly with classroom teachers in their, uh, in their classroom setting. There were two, uh, two of the pilot programs that did not have that feature in them. Um, and um, those, those reports of BTSP impact were lower than, than what the other four were. So does, uh, do the advanced teaching roles uh, programs increase school-wide student performance? So what Dr. Stallings did here is he took the uh, participating LEAs, the schools in those LEAs, and matched them with other schools who were not participating in an ATR program. Um, and those matchings occurred on student demographics, size of the school, um, teacher population in those schools, those kinds of, of things. And and their uh, performance on the accountability model, the state's accountability model. So when we look at these comparison groups, you'll see that the ATR schools are in blue and the, the match schools, the non-participating schools are in yellow. And you could see that while some of the uh, ATR schools did in fact exhibit, exhibit negative growth over that time span, um, the percentage of those schools is smaller uh, than what we see in the match schools. And that's the, the bar graphs on your, on your left. And then if you move over to the right, these are schools that experience positive growth over that period. And the ATR schools slightly ahead of um, um, the, uh, the match schools in what we would consider some uh, positive growth, um, pretty much dead on when we look at moderate growth and actually much higher, twice the percentage rate um, for those schools showing large um, amounts of growth over that time. So the, the report offer also offers some uh, recommendations for how these ATR programs uh, can be improved uh, for scalability. Um, and so I would like to go through a couple of those recommendations with you. Uh, the first is that to require LEA proposals to reflect clearly both identified local needs and statewide lessons learned. So as we um, are in, this, in the process of learning from the, the, the six that have completed their pilot, the four that are still in their second year of their uh, program, and the, uh, the, four new, the three new districts that have been um, adopted as of the most recent RFP, we should be learning lessons from those that their, their implementation and feeding it back to the districts so that their proposals will reflect those um, lessons learned. Provide uh, recurring supplemental implementation funding. Um, it does seem that uh, providing the districts with a planning year and some planning funds um, is, is helpful in, in, in ensuring a successful implementation. 
uh, provide startup funding for planning and early uh, one-time costs. So infrastructure uh, is a big part of this um, of the grant process. And so making sure the districts have the ability to, to change the way they, um, they operate their schools to, uh, to support the ATR. Identify and provide options for LAs, for LEAs to receive third party or uh, state technical support, which is currently part of that process. Um, and allow LEAs adequate time for both planning and program maturation. Now, the the shift from the pilot program to the to uh, for the pilot to the program has addressed that in that um, districts selected for the program now have five years. Um, uh, for their for their programs to to mature before they re, they apply to the state board for renewal. So um, here is the closing thought of the of the author with a um, with a quote from one of the advanced teaching roles, um, <clears throat> and I will let you read that. I won't read that to you, um, but I think it um, is indicative of how. Um, the, the program is building uh, collaboration within the schools and supporting our beginning teachers and working to improve uh, increased student success. I do not want to give the impression here that you know everything there is to know about this report. This is just a very brief overview for you. Um, I encourage you all to read it and um, I am happy to take questions. Uh, about anything you find in it. Um, and for right now, I will um, take any questions or comments board members might have. Thank you, Dr. Tomperlin. Do I hear questions from my colleagues? And this report is, is headed toward the JLEOC. Is that, doc, is that correct, Dr. Tomberlin? Uh, that is my understanding, yes. Dr. Oxendon, I have a question for Dr. Tomberlin. Yes. Um, and this is actually, Dr. Octonon, perhaps a question that um, may also um, have some value to you. But uh, is it possible or do we have um, a the ability, um, Dr. Octonon or Dr. Tomerlin, to disaggregate teacher working conditions um, data at ATR schools um, statewide or regionally so that we might be able to um, find other data points that we use to tease out areas of growth um, and areas of success, but also maybe challenge areas? So I, my response to that would be, uh, depends on what you mean by disaggregation. At what level? At the school level? Or deeper down into some kind of, like the question that was raised earlier today, deeper down at the um, demographic level of either teachers or students? Mr. Bristow Smith, are you Sorry, are Dr. still there? Yes, I performed the remote learning uh, faux pas of unmute. <laughs> um, sorry, Tom. Um, My finger is turning on the video. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Tomberlin, I, I need to think more deeply about my question, but it does occur to me that ATR schools um, are so unique in the way that they create dynamics between um, veteran and master teachers and um, and novice teachers or teachers that um, can benefit from that real-time support that ATR uh, mentor teachers provide. And, you know, most of us at, at the building level principals um, know just the value of uh, that real-time support and how that creates culture. It creates a stickiness to the, uh, to the teaching experience, a desire for them, uh, whether you're the mentor or you're the, uh, the mentee, to double down and reinvest yourself more and more in the, in the culture of the school and your investment in the school. Um, and I guess as an example, Tom, we have a, a school here in Edgecombe um, that has gone from low performing to exceeding or below expectations to exceeding expectations. And when I see that happen, um, I always reach out to the principal and I say, you know, like, help me to understand what made the difference in your one year jump from below expectations to above. And this principal looked right at me and she gave me three names. And those three names were her three mentor um, ATR teachers. Um, and she said, you know, it has changed the culture of her school. And so that leads me to wonder about teacher working conditions generally at ATR schools and if there might be 
um, either data to support that those environments are uniquely different than their um, match schools and the data that you just provided. Just a question and to probe uh, and think more deeply about ways that we can understand what works and what doesn't work at ATR schools and then metrics to represent that when sometimes the data lags, the student achievement data lags behind the, um, the school transformation process. I think it's an interesting question. What I what I don't know is so the teacher working conditions has been going on for a very long time in North Carolina. I think since 2010. So um, I, I don't know if if teachers' perceptions about those questions are kind of solidified around specific things, or if they're broadening those their understanding of things like leadership and the the. Uh, the culture of the school to include this kind of um, relationship with this ma with a master teacher. In other words, are, are teachers in those schools perceiving the questions about leadership as specifically uh, directed towards the principal and the administrative staff at the school, or would they encompass these advanced teaching roles? That I'm not clear about. But to your point, you would need to you would need to broaden their 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 thinking on those questions in order to hopefully attribute it back to the positive changes in culture in the school. Uh, it's an interesting question, one that we would be happy to work on. Um, and maybe it maybe it, it it even suggests a separate section for ATR schools within the teacher working conditions survey that, that could help us get at some of those questions. Yeah, and Tom, yeah. I think sorry, Dr. Oxen, a quick follow-up. Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a similar question I would have for um, you know, Julie Garber and, and Cynthia Martin and her team with regards to restart schools. Um, one of the questions that Julie had raised in yesterday's meeting was uh, looking for ways to assess school transformation and restarts that isn't necessarily pegged to student achievement because we know that student achievement can sometimes lag the implementation dip that comes with a restart school transformation model. So it's a similar question with restarts, with ATRs, perhaps even with other ways of disaggregating or or even, you know, drilling down into our teacher working condition survey to find out what works and what doesn't work. So that's kind of the spirit of the question. I appreciate you indulging it. Thank you, Dr. Oxendine and Tom Berlin. Yeah. Absolutely. Very good questions. Things to consider in the future. My uh, my comments, I certainly won't reply, but I've just added a couple of random thoughts in the chat box. Um, just just some ideas that are just floating around in my head would have to be clarified before they become before they would become something to pursue. Um, uh, so Dr. Oxendine. Absolutely, I hear a voice. Yes, Bev Emery. I just wanted to connect to what um, Matt just said. Uh, he kind of stole my thought process, but it appears that the good data we are starting to build around restart and flexibility would also be a key connector here. You know, if our goal is to prove that buildings having flexibility in lots of different ways, but particularly in this allotment of teacher resource, not being tied to a specific state allotment and having flexibility there. If we're seeing results related to student outcomes in those restart schools that are using that flexibility, and we're seeing them here in a similar fashion, while I know it's not an apples to apples comparison, taking a look at those things you know, side by side could help us again with a powerful lever for that importance of flexible staffing, meeting school need, particularly in our most challenged schools. So I think that's another place for us to try to connect the dots. Well, you use my the words that were about to come forth: connect opportunities for connecting dots, tied to um, two items under ESMP, the TWCS. And the ATR, I can see a, a small committee, maybe an existing advisory committee that will uh, form a think tank around these very important questions going forward. Thank you. Um, we'll move on along to the last item under ESMB, and this is the repeal of 16 NC administrative codes on prepar teacher preparation, educator preparation. I mean, I mean to say, and licensure and presenting that. 
I believe is this Dr. Tomberlin or Dr. Cyberg or Dr. Evans. I'm Hi, that it's Dr. Evans, Dr. Oxen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Evans. It's all yours. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. This this afternoon, I bring to you um, 32 rules to be repealed, and this was approved by Pepsi on October 15th um, to give everyone background for uh, why these rules should be repealed on September 17th, 2020. I know the state board knows from Tom Zyko, um, the general counsel for the state board that 58 licensure and educator preparation rules were approved by the rules review commission. And after those were approved, then we started reviewing the rest of the rules that were already in the administrative code. And from that, we found that 32 of those rules either were duplicates of um, statute or from the rules that were approved in September. So as a result of that, we are brought the 32 rules that need to be repealed to Pepsi in October, gain that approval, and now we bring that to you um, now, and I just want to um, look at the spreadsheet that is in front of you and just let you know that the far left hand column states the SBE policy that it aligns with. And then in blue, you see the number of the rule. And then next to that, you will see the name of the rule. And then the far left, I mean, the right column talks about why or list why the um, the rule is what it duplicates, either statute or um, another rule that was approved in September, or there could be multiple rule and statute that covers that, the repeal of that rule. Okay, questions from the, from my uh, colleagues on the board, this appears uh, like it reminds me of a school librarian or a media coordinator going through uh, collections and doing some weeding. I, I just can't imagine that probably took a lot of work time to go through that, Dr. Evans. It did, it did. It So rules in general, I find um, that I work very closely with um, Mr. Zyko and Lou Martin, um, as well as other people on my team to go through content. It is, it is definitely um, a long process, but it's something that's worth it. And we find that being able to clean house like this will really help us in the long run. Absolutely, good work. Those uh, that conclude those two items, the final two, ES and P one and ES and P two, are under the category of action on first read. So. That concludes my portion of the agenda, Chair Davis. Thank you, Dr. Oxendine. And we will now break and return at 1.30. 1 Public Council. 